the Simon Stewart and Grace um, show uh, in the chat. They said, don't worry, it hasn't started. It's just, uh, you know, colleagues uh, shooting the breeze. So, uh, but it's brilliant to have an opportunity to do to do that. So, um, yeah. and, and to be amongst friends. Okay, so. Um, so we're recording, Sarita, so we've thanks. kicked it off. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. Okay, so um, good morning and welcome all to the second Pan London uh, Council's event addressing the disproportionate impact of COVID on our Black and Asian communities. And the theme of today's event is communicating effectively with communities and the leadership challenge to, to really effect change. And today, you know, we, we, we had um, attendees register for this event, over 300 uh, attendees representing 27 of the London boroughs, as well as um, other organisations that we work with. So, so, you know, brilliant, absolute brilliant um, response. But this is a collective issue and one that demands a collaborative approach to effect a more positive future for our communities. That's why we've gathered here um, today. And we did have a great response to the first event, which we uh, convened towards the end of May. And since then, we have convened a planning group to just look at, you know, really driving this forward from across London councils. We, um, we've distilled the information from the feedback into suggested working groups. Um, and during the session, you will have an opportunity to select which one of those working groups you wish to participate in from your local area. We have also created a K-Hub, a Knowledge Hub site, to effectively share information. And details on how to register for this will be provided in the chat um, shortly. So we are so thankful and privileged for the speakers and panellists who have given up freely of their time to support what we're trying to achieve here. And whilst our attendance in itself is brilliant, if we don't use this, if we don't use this opportunity to power on for better outcomes for our communities, then we will have wasted an opportunity. Before we run through the agenda quickly, I just want to read a quote from Mahatma Gandhi. It's the action, not the fruit of the action, that's important. You have to do the right thing. It may not be in your power. It may not be in your time that there will be any fruit. But that doesn't mean you stop doing the right thing. You may never know what results come from your action. But if you do nothing, there will be no result. So, on the agenda today, we will be um, hearing, and we've got a stellar lineup um, for our panel um, entitled Leading Through Crisis. And we're really going to hear from colleagues kind of regaling their leadership journey, particularly over the last few months. We will um, then go on to hear from Birmingham and, uh, and we know we've got Councillor Paulette Hamilton and Dr. Justin um, Varney from, from, from Birmingham. And they will be speaking to us about um, the innovative uh, engagement and techniques and, and, and how they work with communities and the health and well-being board uh, around um, COVID. We'll then be moving forward to, to hear from Peter and Dan from Hackney about the engagement that they have um, delivered recently within, within that local area. And also we're happy that Peter will be um, joining us in Westminster in the upcoming months uh, to deliver um, the same for our communities. You know, it's a real hot topic at the moment is about um, the topic of vaccinations and the concerns that, are, that exist within the community. And we will conclude with an open forum looking in at that topic and, and, and hope to hear from all of you. So there will be some interactive activities. We were just speaking just before we came on about, um, you know, what the silver linings that COVID has unlocked for us. And one of that has been a much more effective use of technology. Um, and so what we want to do today is really drive actions today. We don't want to, you know, kind of delay those, um, uh, 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 you know, because the time is now. The time is absolutely now. So, um, and you will also note when we speak about interactive, you will note that we've got Jenny Leonard online who, who will be capturing all the outputs and the summary from this event 
directly as we are as we're uh, talking through. So really, really brilliant. Thanks a lot, Jenny, for being here. So just um, on to the kind of more boring stuff now, housekeeping. Please, please, please keep muted um, uh, and, and your cameras off if you're not going to be um, presenting or, or, or speaking. And uh, you, you will notice that we have guests popping up. You'll see a, a notification about guests in the lobby. That's fine. We have an organization crew and they will handle all of that. So don't, don't uh, worry too much about um, admitting them. And we know that the event was oversubscribed. And whilst we're happy about that, we understand that some of your colleagues and friends may have been disappointed not to uh, be present at the event. But the recording will be available in a few days so you can um, reassure them. And we have captured everybody's contact details. So we will be sending that out. OK, so um, without further ado, I think let's move on to the um, let's move on to get into the agenda and to introduce um, the, the panelists, I'm just going to ask um, to hand over to, to our dear colleague, Grace Addy, who is the Head of Learning and Organisational Development at Croydon, um, Croydon Council. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for inviting me to this occasion. Um, so without further ado, so talking about Corona, the speed, we all know the speed and scope of the coronavirus pandemic continues to pose extraordinary challenges, but also extraordinary opportunities across all organizations, sectors, and we know we can basically either, as Serena said, be, seize the momentum to um, look at what we need to do about it or not. Leaders have the opportunity as driving culture to make a determination on the directions that we will pivot in. If you look at my background, I, I, I have a background that basically shows sort of a picture for me around what Corona offers. So there are mountains for us to, to climb, but at the same time, I think there's a lot of opportunities in terms of uh, the positive things that COVID-19 has brought to, to the fore. We're going to have an opportunity to work with uh, and to discuss with four formidable leaders, as um, Serena has presented, to talk to us about how they are managing and leading in, in the four the whole crisis of um, COVID-19. And again, depending on how you look at it, if you look at the, the cup as half full, you can see that there's opportunities as well as challenges. So we have four panelists that are, are going to work with us and, and Serena will be leading a conversation with them. And uh, I will now introduce those four panelists to you. We have our very own Lord Simon Woolley, CBE, who was part of the inaugural event uh, last May, uh, the May, May just passing. And Simon Andrew Woolley, Baron Woolley of Woodford, is a political, at, political and equalities activist he is a founder and director of Operation Black Vote, which has been in operation for 24 years. It is actually in its fourth anniversary right now. So definitely longevity and perseverance is something we can say about Simon, Sir Simon Woolley. And he's the advisory chair of the government of the United Kingdom Race Disparity Unit. He has been a crossbench member of the House of Lords since October 2019. So welcome, Simon. Um, I, I, I feel I can say that because I know you and you've worked with me and thank you for being here. Our next panelist is the host of this event. And thank you so much, um, um, Stuart Love, for uh, the chief exec for Westminster Sister Minister City Council. Stuart Love is the current chief exec since uh, January 2018, and he's previously headed up the City Management and Communities Department, overseeing a range of teams to deliver joint up solutions to complex community problems. He's informed by improved business intelligence and underpinned by the corporate values and behaviors. He also worked at the Westminster C City Council 2003 to 2006 as the head of road management and has held previous roles at Isle White Council between 2006 and 2013, and now Southampton City Council, where he was a director of place. Stewart has been very overt about the need for Westminster to change its culture, and has started that 
that two years ago, leading the authority to become a more inclusive organization which celebrates diversity, rec recognizes that talent is within all, and has spearheaded the launch of three initiatives to support greater ethnic diversity in leadership. Again, thank you, um, Stuart, for hosting this event uh, today once again. I'd like to also introduce Mavis Amankwa. Mavis is a multi-award winning entrepreneur, public speaker, and business coach with over 20 years in the communications and professional services industry. As one of the UK's foremost diversity ambassadors, Mavis has dedicated her career to making a positive impact on the diversity and business world by bridging the gap between communities, whilst conversely transforming social disparities into profitable and sustainable business models. Again, welcome Mavis. And finally, but definitely not least, Paul Benjamin. Paul Benjamin was appointed the UK Finance Director in June 2017. In this role, Paul is responsible for all finance and accounting operations in Microsoft's UK subsidiary and is a member of the subsidiary leadership team. Paul joined Microsoft in 2010 and has performed various roles as a marketing and operations controller in the UK, CFO Netherlands in 2012, and Regional Finance Director for Western Europe in 2015. Prior to joining Microsoft, Paul held multiple senior financial management positions, leading teams. Paul has been leading for Microsoft COVID-19 as well. Thank you very much, panelists, for this, um, uh, for joining us. And I'm going to hand over to Serena, who will engage you in a series of questions and conversations to take us forward in terms of getting you at your experience in leading COVID-19. Thank you. Over to you, Serena. Thanks. Thanks, Grace. Thanks so much for um, such a useful uh, kind of introduction for our panellists. Um, might I just ask now that the panellists uh, all, all come on, um, if you can uh, switch on your cameras um, and unmute, that would be brilliant. Hi, Paul. Um, so, Stuart and Mavis? I'm here, Serena. Oh, okay. It's my screen, I can't see. Okay, brilliant. Um, so, thank, thank you very much for, for joining and for taking the time out. So, we just had um, a few questions initially just to kick off, and then we know that the uh, uh, attendees on the call will, will surely have some uh, follow up questions. So, maybe. Um, Simon, if I could start with you, really, um, and we were speaking just a little bit in the break, but um, you mentioned about, you know, previously um, that when when speaking to colleagues, their understanding about the, you know, the disproportionate impact being linked to the social inequalities was at minus 10. And you say now you feel as though the conversations move forward till at least a, a zero position. Um, how, how have you found that? How have you found leading in, particularly in a political context, when others don't share your concerns? How, how has that been? Well, as, as you know, these have been extraordinary few months. And, uh, you know, it just dawned on me, Serena, that um, it's two months ago since that inaugural meeting. And it was such a historic meeting. In many ways, for me personally, quite an emotional meeting um you know it was the first time that i'd that we'd had a conversation with so many people hundreds hundreds and hundreds of people that, that had come to that call and we shared and we empathized and we believed each other and it was it was um fulfilling draining mm. but but also i think serena that we begun a momentum I mean, two months later, people are still talking about that meeting back in May. I think we caught the moment that after seeing the many black and brown faces on our TV screens, those working in the hospitals and the care, the care homes, the bus drivers, the security guards that had all sadly, sadly lost their lives. And then, of course, with George Floyd 
as well that that our society was convulsed into having conversations that perhaps we've never had before or or perhaps never in the same way as we've begun to have over the past few months and i think that's been the most rewarding element i mean for me I don't know whether I mentioned it before, but it seems to me that many more people, uh, predominantly white, but also black too, uh, uh, have been seeing the world through, if you like, how can I put this, a very black lens. Mm. And in that black lens, they've been saying that things aren't fair, things aren't right, and we, we need to we need to change. And I think, you know, in that meeting and subsequent meetings, but particularly that one, Serena, I don't know how you felt. I know that Grace um, spoke about this beforehand. I think we've made a lot of friends mm. uh, and begun to understand each other more. Um, mm. uh, and that is, a, that is a moment, an historic moment. But I think what this meeting is about now is, yes, we're no longer in minus 10. We're no longer having to say, do you believe me uh, that the playing field uh, isn't level? Mm. Do you, we're no longer saying, do you believe me that in my work life, in my students' education, uh, in the hospitals, that too often the system's rigged rigged against us mm. I, I think we're no longer saying that now people are saying yes it is how can we change and that's monumental mm. but it's only monumental it's only monumental if we're at ground floor and we build 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 and i think i think serena that that for me that's the most exciting thing that out of all the heartache all the tragedy that today we've got 206 people. We've got the chief executive of Westminster who uh, who has joined us again. And I think what we're doing is we're sewing a golden thread, a golden thread with good people that want to move the dial. And I, I, I'm excited about it. It's, it's still not easy. It still won't be a walk in the park. But I would just say one, one, two, one thing, and I, I, I we've got a long session, two things I would say. One is that on this journey, this roller coaster journey, I would say to all your listeners, please, please take care of yourselves. Mm. I know that you're hungry, that you're, that you're passionate about wanting to change the world, but please remind yourself to look after yourself, to take time out, to take care of your loved ones too. Um, and the, the, the second point, point that I want you to do is to, is to be more ambitious than you've ever been in your life. Because I would argue that the rigged system has always been telling you to be cautious, mm. has always been telling you that if you go two steps forward, you're doing well, when in your, when in, in your heart... You could go 10 steps forward. Uh, and so look after yourself, be ambitious, share the love, share that connection. And this is what we are. This is what we are experiencing yeah. out of the pain of COVID-19 and the death of George Floyd. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, um, Simon. And I think for our other panelists, you, you're always a difficult act to follow. So, um, uh, but, but I'm sure they, they're absolutely up for the challenge. Um, okay, so just mo moving forward, and I think um, Simon will pick up on some of what you said um, when we kind of come to the wider, um, uh, the wider segment. So really, so so moving on um, to to Stuart. Um, hi, Stuart. So um, hi, and, hi. So. Stuart, I suppose when I was reflecting on this um, session, and you and I have many, many conversations, um, brilliant, um, you know, around this topic and, and, and further about our kind of inclusive agenda. But how have you found leading at, during this time, so leading this big organisation, 
to make sure that we as an organization continue to deliver what we need to to our residents, our stakeholders. But also picking up on, on, on Simon's point about how do you do that and balance that um, acknowledging and being mindful of the issues affecting staff? How, how have you managed that um, during this time? Thank you, Serena, and uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for uh, having me along this morning. And I actually just wanted to start, Serena, by saying uh, from where I've been sat throughout this, I think the public sector's response um, and local government in particular, obviously, um, I think it's been phenomenal um, and leadership has been demonstrated across the entirety of the public sector. And I've seen lots of, of very strong, good leadership uh, in, in local authorities, which I think has been fantastic. I also, Grace, um, in, in a very, um, thank you very much, Grace, for what you said in introducing me. Um, the, the journey that we've been on in Westminster around changing our culture with the issue of diversity and inclusion at the forefront is really important and it's really important in the context of um, my answer because we need to be a much more diverse organization that at the very least is representative of the, the communities that we serve. But you've asked about um, how I've led the organization um, through this crisis and I think the short answer is I haven't. Um, this hasn't been about me. There has been shared leadership across the organization, which is something um, I've really wanted and tried to push since I've been in this role. This can't be just about one person. So I I've seen a huge amount of leadership across the organization, teamwork, um, collaboration, which has happened organically um, in, in the face of, of the crisis. And, th and that's been outstanding. And we talk a lot about um, the fact in Westminster, everybody's the leader. And we've seen that come to the fore um, in the last four months. And I think, Serena, I am going to use you and the, and the VME network as an example of that, because the leadership that you have demonstrated, in particular in setting up these two events, so the one in May and the one we're having today, um, has been outstanding. And one of the things I, I absolutely love about you is that you never ask for permission. You just get on and do what's right. Um, and that's crucially important. Occasionally you'll tell me what you intend doing, but generally you get on and do it. And we need more people like that. We need more leaders like that. Um, it's, it, it has been absolutely brilliant. Um, there have been some very difficult things about this, though. I, I'm somebody who um, I don't like hierarchy. I don't like process. Um, and I, I struggle with um, structure, to be honest. And when the crisis hit, what as an organization and, and pretty much the whole of local government did this, we go into our kind of command and control structures. So all of the things that I don't like, I immediately had to impose on the organization. Um, and what was pointed out to me as a result of all of this is we suddenly went from all of the change we'd, had, we'd, we'd been doing through the culture of the organization to in effect having a bunch of white men running the organization again. W with the exception, I have to say, of the leader of the council who, who is uh, clearly not um, a white man. Um, and there's some real lessons for us in terms of how we approach this in the future. But also, you know, operating in a command and control style environment is not sustainable. That's only supposed to be in place for a matter of days, not weeks or months as we've we've now been in. Um, and that whole approach also highlighted, I think, for me, um, whilst I've spoken positively about the culture change we've been on, that we still have a very, very long way to go. And, and you know, I've, I've made many mistakes in the last four months, and I'm very grateful that you know, people in the organization have challenged me. They've been very honest with me about the mistakes that they've seen me make, and then they've helped me to, to, um, to put those right. But one of the, the absolute lessons for me is it's very easy when we slip into this command and control uh, type response to lose sight of the culture, to lose sight of all of the really good things we've been pushing for a very long time in the organization. Um, and so I've spoken before about the fact that I will be relentless, and we have to be relentless in pursuing that, um, that change in culture and in pursuing diversity and inclusion and not letting anything become an excuse for, for letting that drop off the agenda. I, I think, um, Serena, you, you touched on this earlier, the, the way we are engaging at the moment with our, our communities uh, and staff through the use of technology has been fantastic. We are reaching far more people than we were able to previously. One of the things I actually really love about Teams is, is it's much less formal. So, you know, the chat function gives everybody an opportunity to contribute. Um, and we, we've found that using that, we've, we've had much more reach into our communities um, and also with our staff. And I think, you know, um, Lord Willie mentioned the importance of, of looking after each other. And one of the examples I, I give uh, in the organization uh, and looking after ourselves is, you know, and this wasn't um, somebody gave me this. 
but if you think about when you get in an airplane and the cabin crew say, you know, when the mask drops, the first thing is put the mask on your own face before you look after the people around you. And that has been a constant message back to our organization is look after yourselves, look after yourselves so you can look after your families, your loved ones, and so that you can then do your job back into our communities. And it is absolutely um, crucial that people do that. And, you know, I, for me, uh, in my now two and a half years as chief executive, the most difficult time I have faced was in the wake of the killing of George Floyd. And um, at the same time, the understanding that had emerged around the impact of uh, the pandemic on our BME communities. It, it was the most difficult time I, I have faced in this role. And, that, and frankly, that I can remember in my career at the moment. Um, and I am very grateful again to people in our organization who helped me with that, who helped lead the organization through that, for the honesty, for the ability to have some of those very difficult um, conversations. And Serena, as you said to me, the support we had in turning up imperfectly rather than um, not turning up at all. And I, I just wanted to finish with something actually that um, Lord Woolley said in the first one of these events, where um, he, Lord Woolley used the phrase, it now is the time for us to rethink and redouble our efforts. And that is absolutely what we need to do. We, and we need to raise our ambitions. I have said that to the organization. Our ambitions have to be much greater than they, than they were. Um, but it's also a time in the organization where people are tired. It has been a relentless four months. Um, and I'm very conscious of that, which comes back to, to what um, we've said about people looking after themselves. But also from a leadership perspective, now more than ever, we need to lead with compassion, empathy and kindness and an understanding of our own staff and our communities in order to do our jobs properly. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Serena. Thanks a lot, Stuart. Um, brilliant. Thanks, thanks for that. And um, just picking up on, on one of the things you said when you were, um, you must have known that Paul uh, from, from Microsoft was going to follow you when you were very complimentary about Microsoft Teams. But it's, it's absolutely true um, how, you know, it's, it's, it's just been amazing. And I, I guarantee that if we were to have hosted this event as a, as a physical event, uh, we likely wouldn't see um, the support in terms of numbers um, turning up. So, so thank you um, very much. So, Paul, Paul Benjamin, just so, 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 so moving on to you as as our representative here from from Microsoft, and brilliant that um, you know that you can join us today. So, thank you so much for for taking that time out. So, Paul, I suppose as part of the leadership of you know such a monumental uh, business um like microsoft you know world renowned in 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 virtually um in probably in most homes across the world what hurdles um, and challenges have you come across as as a leader in in big business and how i suppose do you support as part of your leadership team maintaining that kind of morale when there's changing market conditions and we you know we we don't know what the future holds how, how has that been for you yeah so uh, first off let me say thank you for the opportunity to be part of this group today um so as you heard in my introduction not only am i the, the cfo and i lead the crisis management team but i'm also the exec sponsor for our bame community um, within microsoft uk as well so um, you know, this really has been an unprecedented four months mm -hmm. for us, and it's actually hit on all of the areas that I'm leading from an organisational perspective as well. Um, and you know, it was great to hear Stuart talking about our products. I do love to hear people talking positively about our products, primarily because it hits on our core mission. Right? Our core mission is to empower every individual and every organisation to do more. And hearing people talk about how they use our products and the impact that our products are having on them means that we're actually delivering against that mission that we, we set out to, to, to deliver. Um, it was really interesting because at the, well, halfway through the pandemic, our CEO, Satya Nadella, he, he said he, um, in one of our earnings releases that what we've experienced is two years worth of digital transformation in two months. Mm -hmm. So every, everything that we would have taken two years to do is actually happened in two months. That manifests itself for our customers um, in terms of remote working, using Teams, but through schools as well, through remote teaching, uh, through helping other larger public sector organisations to stand up the technology that they need to uh, to meet the demands of the public. So the NHS and United Care Hospitals are a really clear point in that. Um, and what actually comes through from all of that is 
you know, we have to be able to make decisions in a really agile, fast way. Yeah? And as a leader, we have to make people comfortable in making those decisions in that way as well. So we were making decisions in a matter of days that historically it would have taken us months to make. We were making mistakes. We were helping people to recognize and learn from their mistakes, but not feel punished by them, to actually to, to celebrate the learning that we got from them and help them move forward and then, um, you know, um, have the confidence that they can go and they can take another risky decision, but with the learning that they had before. So that speed of decision making was a was a huge piece for us. Um, the second big hurdle that we probably came across was that the flexibility that we had to give our people. So all of a sudden, all of our people were working from home and we were very used to working from home for one or two days a week. But all of a sudden, we're working from home five days a week. We have our children at home with no childcare. We may be looking after extended families. This was something particularly that we saw in our Bain community as well. The extended family that they were trying to manage was it made it incredibly difficult for them. So as a responsible employer, we couldn't say, well, you, you have to do that and work eight hours a day, making sure that you're working through these times. So we had to try and manage the flexibility of what our employees needed um, at the same time as delivering what we and our customers needed as well. So that manifested itself in us creating um, new leave schemes so people could take blocks of time off so that they could be with their families and manage their childcare to giving people the flexibility to say, well, actually, I'm going to work in the morning. I'm going to work eight till 12. And then in the afternoon, I'm going to look after my children and my partner will be able to work. So you know, we were actually having to accommodate people's different ways of working and people's different needs as well as we as we went through that. And then the third thing that we really had to de deal with, and this is this is probably the biggest and the thing that had the most impact was COVID hit and then other things happened as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and a lot of these things were just normal things that if they happened in isolation, you, pay, you maybe you wouldn't have paid any attention to them, but actually happening at the same time as COVID, you had to deal with them in a different way. There were some small things that happened within our organization, but then there were some big things that happened as well. So the death of George Floyd and how we handled that and how we brought those communities together um, in order to make sure that we understood and we gave everybody a voice so that they could raise their concerns, they could raise their feelings in, um, through that uh, time as well. And so we could learn and take action from it too. So, you know, you can't just say COVID hit and that was the only thing that we had to deal with. We had to deal with COVID and we had to deal with other big things that were happening at the same time as well. And that's all about giving people permission to say, actually, no, my priority's here, my priority's not over here. So I'm not going to do that, but I'm going to do this thing over here because that's where I think I will have the most impact for the people and the organization and our customers um, all at the same time. Um, when I think about motivation um th there are a couple of things that come to mind when you work remotely one of the biggest things that people tell us from a microsoft perspective is the thing that they miss are those coffee coffee corner conversations mm -hmm. right you can't recreate a coffee corner conversation it could be a five minute conversation about how your weekend was it could be a a 10 minute conversation about my customer's about to do this and you might want to get involved but those little intimate conversations where you pick up so much information is what's really really important and you can't recreate that in teams you can't create a well, you, you can try to, but it doesn't work in quite the same way because a lot of those conversations are quite fortuitous and they just happen when they happen. So when you think about motivation, you do think about bringing people together. So we started organising teams meetings that were not about the business. So we would have pub quizzes, we would um, do virtual off-sites and bring people together and do, uh, we did a... Um, a virtual escape room, for example, just to keep people together um, and keep people collaborating together, but not necessarily always thinking about work. Um, we increased the amount of communication that we did with people as well. So from a leadership team perspective, we used to have what we call a town hall. We used to do it once a quarter where we'd bring the whole organization together. Virtually, you can do that much more often. So now we do it monthly and we make it, we keep it to an hour, but we keep that constant communication going as well. And then we try and keep the leadership team as visible as possible. Right? So I will go and spend time with some of the other functions and making sure that they can hear and see from me. And then I bring them in to do um, um, to, to come and speak in my team as well and that way we get a lot of cross-pollination and we do manage to keep that motivation going i would say the one thing that is hugely important through all of this is just transparency yeah transparency with your people transparency with your customers and transparency with the overall organization as well brilliant thank thank you um thank you so much paul and it's and it's really useful to see that um even Microsoft are doing uh, 
virtual pub quizzes and, and virtual escape rooms. I'm really interested in that one in particular, but quite a lot of the uh, organisations and colleagues across the, I think in Westminster, we, we, we managed to do our um, Westminster Games, which is a staff event where we kind of get involved uh, in, in kind of physical activities and there's a competition. We, we, we did that virtually as well, which was no mean feat. So congrats to the organisers there. So um, thank you very much. And I know that Mavis is currently uh, experiencing some issues in terms of coming on. So what, what I'm going to do now, um, just probably open it up to, to, to colleagues on the call um, who may want to ask questions of the panel. So we've got our dear colleagues, Jay, Sharma, Kasha, Marina and Veronica, just kind of monitoring the chat. Um, are, are there any questions in the chat so far for any of the panellists? Currently, there's no questions in the chat, Serena. Um, if you Can't want, believe I can, that. <laughs> <laughs> I can pose you a question to keep us going while some other people Please. have questions in. Uh, so one question um, is, in becoming a leader, uh, what has challenged and inspired you and what gives you the stamina to keep going? Brilliant. And so we throw that out to, to any or all of the panellists. I, I would argue, I would argue that the best leaders, Serena, are leaders like you. Uh, I don't want, I don't mean to embarrass you, but... Can't be embarrassed, Simon. Got three that's, children. Just, well, you know. That's good. <laughs> but let me, let, let me try and explain. Uh, what I've seen over the last uh, few months, Serena, is you become, in many ways, a reluctant leader. A, a reluctant leader is somebody that doesn't work up and say, I want to be a leader and I want people to listen to me. A reluctant leader wakes up and says, I need to do this. I must organize this. I must get this done. And it's in moments of crisis in which leaders emerge who Serena, you probably surprise yourself about your energy, your passion, and your skill. And I think for for people um, like Stuart, that is able to able to recognise that organic leadership. These are the people we need to be promoting. These are the people we need to be elevating, because out of almost nowhere they've emerged. And look. When I started Operation Black Vote, 24 years ago, Grace, you're right. 24 years ago last week was our birthday. I had no grey hair. <laughs> and I, 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 probably, uh, I look younger, I hope. Um, but I used to be afraid of public speaking. Mm. I mean petrified. When, it was, when we were around the table and it was my turn to speak, my heart would beat so fast, I thought I wouldn't get the words out. But, you know, hear this. I felt, particularly when I was working for Charter 88, which was a white organization, and I was the only black person in the room, I felt, Serena, that if I didn't speak as nervous as I was, what needed to be said would not be, not be said. Mm. And so it would come round to me and I could hear my throat like this, like this, but I forced myself. Yeah. And again and again and again and again, and I, I think that COVID has done that to, to many of your, many uh, uh, of the 210 that are on this, that you're here because you care. Mm -hmm. And when you care, you are galvanized into making a difference. I mean, you know, we've got Paul here from Microsoft. He's been thrust into the limelight because we have demanded, mm -hmm. we have demanded the technology function for us. But mm -hmm. Paul will be saying, Paul would be saying, OK, I want the technology to work for everyone, but I need to make sure that those who normally get left behind, that too often look like you and me, Serena, are not left behind in the digital divide, in the educational divide. So in, in this leadership, in this leadership space, that we want leaders with a conscience, we want leaders with a good heart that are strong, where you can point the finger to, I've had to point the finger quite a few times these last few months, but the energy takes 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 you along. Thanks, and um, thanks, Simon. And, and what I will say is that 
there are so many reluctant leaders, you know, across not not just Westminster, but across, you know, kind of London councils and, you know, and 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 they pop up in, in various guises and, and, and forms. So but thankful for, for, for your comments. But I don't know, Paul or Stuart, if you wanted to come back on that particular point or I've got some other questions. to. Yeah, no, I, I think. I, I love the idea of reluctant leaders um, and, and I see it every day in my organisation. You can put people in charge of things and they will not do a great job as a leader. You can let people emerge as leaders um, and they do an absolutely amazing job. It's all about finding the passion in you mm -hmm. that will lead you to want to be a leader. Yeah, and then you will develop that as, as, as you as you go forwards as well. Um, and as I said, we we see this all the time in our organisation. Yeah, those people who grow into roles or grow into leadership are the ones that actually do um, the best from a leadership perspective. Um, and that passion is the thing that really comes through for them. I, I, Serena, I just again agree with that. I think reluctant leaders are, are um, brilliant. And I, one of the things that was said to me at the, uh, you know, near the beginning of this by people in our organisation was that they were seeing an abundance of management, but very little leadership. And I think partly that was because of my point about people being put into roles as part of a kind of hierarchical structure. But since then, we have seen that organic leadership and authentic leadership come up through the organisation, which is brilliant. Brilliant, thank you. So I suppose, um, you know, we, we've spoken about sort of like the last four months and, uh, you know, the kind of seeing the impact of the pandemic and needing to kind of almost maintain a business as usual um, in terms of delivery of services, etc. How do we how do we continue to build? And, and, and definitely this is one point that, that came through very strongly from the first event where other London councils and colleagues were saying, Serena, you have this as a high um, priority on the, on the agenda of Westminster. How do we get that in our areas? And how can we continue to, to build momentum? How can we continue to ensure that, on t you know, how can, and, and I think Meghan Markle, um, um, uh, you know, um, said this, that we have to rebuild and rebuild and rebuild, you know, until it's re rebuilt, basically. How can we continue to build that momentum? I if we can maybe take from one of the panellists and then I can see that Sharma's got a few uh, questions coming through. Panellists, don't all speak at once. Come on now, come on, you know. <laughs> Go on, Paul. I, I think... What we see in our organisation when we want um, when we want other areas to learn from what we've done um, is that it takes one or two people to really go out and showcase it, right? To show people how to make it happen. Um, the reason people come and ask is because they don't know, but they want to learn. So we find that by creating small communities of people that take the learnings from one area and share it into another area has a real powerful impact on allowing those other areas to develop and grow the capabilities and grow the infrastructure that they need to embed uh, things like this into, into their businesses um, as we go forwards. Um, so, you know, I, I would encourage that the fostering and the sharing and the, the community feel between um, between and um, between local government areas. I, I would argue, Serena, that, you know, in these uncomfortable truths, these big questions that we've that we've been thrust to confront. I think one of the big ones is also and I see it in the chat box around um, the DNI diversity inclusion. Diversity and inclusion has not worked for black people. So what happens is, is that you have this big thing about diversity and inclusion. And everybody says, yes, we're doing well. Look at our figures. Look at our this. Look at our that. And you scratch the surface and it spot the black person. But because it's DNI, it looks good. And black people have been scratching their heads for time and saying, and saying, I'm not still getting a fair shake on this. So, you know, one of the questions one of the questions that the institutions, Microsoft and our local authorities have to say to themselves, is our DNI really working for all the communities that seem to be always getting left behind? And in that, and in that, and in that answer, what are the different ways to ensure that talent 
can come through. This is, these are uncomfortable truths, but they must be confronted. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank, thanks, Simon. Um, Sharma, and I could, there's another hand up, but I can't, I can't see it. I've got too many things open on my screen. But Sharma, can you come in with um, any questions in the last uh, five minutes or so? And yeah, sure. So we've got one on, um, we've got quite a few actually, we've got one from Amy and there's quite a few other people have asked related questions about, uh, so Mal uh, Charmaine Malcolm's asked as well, um, how uh, we can get other councils to uh, replicate the way that Westminster's working um, and how, uh, Stuart, would you be supporting other local authorities with your to take a similar leadership approach um, and particularly recognising uh, that the number of senior leaders from BAME communities continues to be around 2 to 4%, which perhaps touches on um, some of the things that um, Sir Willie's just been, uh, Lord Willie's just been saying. Uh, and then we've also got some questions for Paul um, around um, A&I technologies um, and whether they have bias and how do we combat that? And that's from Janelle. Okay, brilliant. Thank, thanks, Sharma. So maybe if we can just a collective answer. And one thing I will say, this is not necessarily about us showcasing Westminster as, you know, the only model. Um, I think we have taken a particular journey uh, based on, you know, the kind of um, uh, the community of Westminster, you know, and, and, and in terms of the staff. Um, what I think, though, and I might just ask Stuart to just come back in terms of what, what, what can that leadership piece be across kind of London councils? Yeah. And then we'll perhaps just come to Paul just to pick up on um, on, on some of those answers. But thanks, Stuart. Thanks, Serena. I, can I just say I completely agree with what Simon said about confronting those really difficult and uncomfortable truths because they still do exist and they exist in our organisation. And I think, Simon, that's where we need your help. Um, and how we do that better um, going forward. But just in response to the question, um, there, there, on the back of this, one of the things that has happened is that there's a group of chief executives represented across London, um, currently being led by um, Kim Smith, who's the chief executive of, of Hammersmith and Fulham, that have come together on the back of um, George Floyd and on the back of uh, the impact of the, the virus on our BAME communities to work out how, as a collective, London is much better at this and to, to work out how we learn from each other. I um, am part of that group. It's, you know, we, we volunteered to be part of it. Um, and the real thing here, Serena, I think, is how we learn from each other. It's not, you know, Westminster's done some things, but we're not perfect. We know that. And, and the things that we've done, we have learned from other places. So um, it, it is about that um, shared understanding and sharing of best practice and how we, we implement that across the whole of London. So I am very happy to say that that has happened. It should have happened a long time ago, frankly. It shouldn't have taken this crisis and the killing of George Floyd to result in this happening across London. But it is now happening. Um, and that leadership at chief executive level is now there. And, and I can see it now being disseminated in other organisations across London. So that's great, um, Stuart. And I think um, the challenge and perhaps what we should do is invite um, colleagues from that group yeah. to come and, and, and address us here at, at, the, at, at maybe the next session. Because I think for colleagues working on the ground in those authorities, they need to feel that work is happening and, and actually feel the difference before we can even feel that within yeah. communities. So so that's brilliant. And I think we'll definitely take that forward as an, um, as an action. Really good idea. Um, thanks. Um, so, Paul, I don't know if you want to come back on the kind of artificial intelligence um, uh, and, and as a director around, program director around regeneration, I'm really kind of interested also to see how we can start to use, you know, such techniques or tools to kind of better engage with all of our communities um, around some of our housing development and, and stuff like that. I don't know if you um, can come back on that point. Well, so, the, so the first question was, does or is artificial intelligence biased? And it's a really hard question to answer. And I'd love to say that it isn't biased. But mm -hmm. if you look at the representation that we have um, across any organization that creates artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence is probably going to be biased to the people that are program it. And it has to learn a broader range of skills in order to not be biased going forwards. Um, where we spot bias, we try and then make sure that we identify it and we change it so that it doesn't um, actually reflect that way at all. I think there's a huge opportunity for artificial intelligence to be the differentiator 
um, and actually to cut through a lot of the bias, but that requires quite a lot of work from our perspective. And it requires quite a lot of learning as well, learning and relearning um, in terms of not just how we use it, but you know how we categorize things, how we talk about things. They all tend to lead us towards bias. Um, I think it's really important when we think about ourselves as leaders um, and how we understand the biases that we have as well. Everybody has biases. It's just a matter of um, making sure you understand your biases and actually trying to combat them as well. Right? And the more you learn about your biases, the more that you'll, um, you'll force them out of your ways of behaving um, as well. We've just started doing a huge amount around recruitment and making sure that we're recruiting in the right ways and we're actually eliminating those biases, racial biases, but as well as other biases as well, right? So um, instead of um, bringing everybody in to do a deep technical interview, you might do workshops where people behave differently rather than people who can do very well in one-to-one -one situations versus group uh, situations. And then we need to orientate that towards our main communities as well. Right? We need to give them the best opportunities to shine. We need to do more work locally in schools and universities to bring those talents out and then show them the path that they can take in order to get into a company like Microsoft or another large company. That's quite often where it breaks down for me in the fact that they don't know the path to get there and we need to help them with that path. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So, um, as you can imagine, we've we've already, um, you know, and, and those of you who were on the um, uh, event the last time <clears throat> will know that, you know, one of my great challenges is um, is uh, timekeeping at events because I could just talk forever and ever and ever and ever. But I think I'm getting better at it. It's been one of my challenges through um, COVID. So I try to make sure that the technology can support me. So I've I've got colleagues pinging me now saying, stop talking. Um, so anyway, I'm just going to round up um, this 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 first session. And, you know, again, uh, you know, many, many, many thanks to to, to all of the panelists who um, have given of their time. And I suppose some key things for me really does come out is this need for, for us to maintain momentum, you know, for us to be relentless in our efforts um, in terms of what we are gonna deliver for our communities, to be more ambitious than we've ever been before, but to also be balanced and to look after ourselves and to look after our colleagues. So really the, the sense of compassionate um, leadership comes through very, very strongly. And I think this is something that we see, you know, um, I'm quite busy on LinkedIn and, and you know, many, many um, posts around this concept of, of compassion in terms of leadership in a way that maybe a year or so ago, it wasn't, it, it didn't dominate um, in, in terms of that type of paradigm. So I think, um, yeah, let's absolutely resolve as, uh, as London Council's here and our, and our other organisations who have joined to keep this moving, to keep moving forward um, and, and for us to not, not let up and let's continue to rebuild and rebuild until it is rebuilt for our communities. Thank, so thank, thank you very much. Serena, can I leave you with a quote from, please, John, please. from John Lewis? John, John Lewis was the disciple of Dr. Martin Luther King. I see myself as a disciple of Dr. Martin Luther King, but he was shoulder to shoulder. He said this, do not get lost in a sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. A struggle is not a struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble, the late John Lewis. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon. And um, that is a, 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 true, a truly brilliant way to, to end this, you know. We have to keep it moving. We absolutely have to. And, and you know, it is a marathon and it's not a sprint. And there have been days, and I've spoken with colleagues, where we felt despondent. You know, that's probably the best word to accurately de define how, how, how we felt. You know, but in those moments, let's come together and let's keep it moving. Because if we don't do anything, nothing will happen. Thank you very much to Paul, um, Stuart and Simon for your time this morning. And I know Mavis, unfortunately, you were able to join uh, belatedly, but we'll definitely be able to uh, pick up some points with you later down in, 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 in the um, session. So thank you very much. And now I'm just going to move um, on to introduce 
our dear colleagues, um, Sheila Saki, who's Service Development Manager in, in Westminster, and Masuda uh, Begum, who is a graduate uh, on, on, on one of our graduate schemes, currently working within um, public health. So I'll just um, hand over to them to take us through some of the interactive uh, sessions. Th thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thanks, Serena, and thanks to all our speakers so far. It's been amazing. Um, I just put we just put up a, a question. Um, you should be able to see it on your screens. Um, we are um, seeking really feedback from you all in relation to the working groups, which came out uh, um, in the first meeting that we had in May, and uh, we we've we put together these themes, and we've actually just put a, um, a survey within the chat for you to vote for these. Um, working groups. So the first one is community, um, community communication and civic engagement, e economic re recovery, which includes small and medium sized enterprises and employment, health and well-being, children and young people, housing, um, and the last one is internal organisational capability. So please, if you can vote, um, please, if you can vote for um, the working group that you're interested in being part of. And what will happen after this is that we will um, be in touch with you because um, once you vote, we, we do automatically get your details on the system and we'll be in touch with you to set up the working groups and, and get moving on some of these really important priority areas. So I'm just going to give everybody a, a few minutes to do their voting, but it's all it's in the chat. Um, if you can't see it, just scroll up. So you should be able to use the voting app um, the voting function within the app, within the chat, sorry. Brilliant. Thanks, um, Sheila. And I can see colleagues there um, are, are, are voting as we speak. And this is brilliant. This is Teams, right? This is, you know, this is work in action. No longer are we going to send out a, a form after the event to ask you what you want to participate in. And, and really, this is, you know, you may think, oh, what have I got to contribute to any of these working groups? You know, listen, let's let's just come together because together we will work it out. Um, and it's really about from your areas. Uh, if you um, if you think to yourself, do you know what? There's other colleagues who who could um, lend support or lend expertise in any of these areas. Please, please, please. The ask of you is that you go back into your organisations, um, into your local authorities, and you you recruit those people. Um, you know, this is this is not a problem for black and Asian uh, people to fix. This is a problem for us as local authorities, you know, the part that we have to play in it, it is a collective, it's collective responsibility. These are the communities that we um, deliver services to and we must improve, um, you know, we must do what we can to improve uh, their their outcomes and their recovery um, from, from COVID. So, yeah, brilliant. Um, and I think Sheila will just allow um, a couple of minutes for people to um, to kind of uh, 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 do that. I, I can see in the chat, I wasn't able to see before when I was presenting, but many, many questions. Um, you know, we will be collating those those questions and, and linking in with our um, colleagues to 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 answer those. So uh, don't worry if it hasn't if it hasn't been addressed in 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 the uh, panel. Uh, we we will get we will um, be answering those um, either today or um, afterwards. Thanks, Sheila. Sorry, Jay, you wanted to um, come in. Yeah, hi, Sabrina. I was just going to say um, there are some comments in the chat box. Um, people, I think, are worried their votes aren't being registered. It just might be worthwhile saying not to worry if anything's been missed, we can pick that up from the chat or they can contact us separately for their um, interest to be shown for which group they want to join. Yeah, can I just make a comment on that? Um, I'll just come in on that. So if you can't vote, if, uh, if you see the vote, scroll scroll right up and it should be there. But if you can't, if you just write in the, the um, chat which group you're interested in, we can capture it that way as well. You could just write but I can see that. Could you do me a favour and just put the slides back just um, for the next question and then I'll control afterwards. Apologies. OK, Catherine, could you pop the slides back up, please? Uh, 
Catherine, are you able to put the slides back up? Thanks, thank you. Do you want the next slide, Sheila? Or? Yes, please. Okay. So um, for our second interactive question, um, it's a question really is just to get some feedback from you as to whether we've actually got these groups right. So this is what we um, as a group thought that people wanted in terms of the working groups. But what we'd like from you is to know if there, there are any that we've missed out. So if there are any particular areas that you feel that's come out of maybe today's discussion or you've gone away and thought thought actually we, we should really do more on, on um, a, a separate thing, um, we've, we've created a Slido which you can access um, either by your, your phone or you can actually scan using the camera on your phone. Um, if you open the camera on your iPhone and you scan this, um, this QR reader um, on, in front of your screen, you should be able to get to it. Um, and if you go to Slido on your phone or on your PC and you put in the access code, which is 99952, that will take you to it as well. And you can input into that if you have any additional ideas that um, for us to have as working group topics. So um, I'll just leave that up for a few seconds and then I'll flip over. So I can see um, people are in there already um, putting in Sheila. their comments. And I'm going to switch on to that now. Sheila, is the, is the um, link in the um, chat for this slide or, or is it? Yes, I'm just going to okay. paste it in. Apologies, right, hold okay. on. That makes it just easier if people want to... Uh, yeah, yeah, if people just want to click it. Apologies, sorry. Kasha, did you want to come in with um, comments? Or? Uh, yes, there were a few questions. Uh, people are asking if it is possible to vote for more than one group. Can we clarify that, please? Yes, you can. Thank you. And, and if you've, you know, if you've uh, done one, you're not certain that it's going to, um, yeah, no, you can do it on the um, on, on, on the voting thing, yeah. But if any problems, then please just put it in the, um, put your name in the chat and then we'll get to you. Okay, so the Slido um, link is now in the chat. So if you're um, on your PCs, then uh, it will just open straight up into the, um, in, into that live poll. Can you all see the live poll? You can see the word cloud, all the ideas coming in. Uh, let's have a look. Yes, yes, we, I can see that on my screen, yeah. Brilliant. So we've got lots of really good ideas. Thank you so much, everybody. Yeah. So we we'll probably let this run for a, um, uh, a a couple more minutes, uh, actually, uh, and then we will um, move on to um, Councillor Paulette Hamilton. Uh, and and Councillor Hamilton, I know your time is limited, so perhaps if we're um, if we're not able to complete this now, Sheila, we can bring it back um, during the break uh, to let to let um, attendees be able to view it. Um, yeah, let, that's fine. Yeah, I'll just let it run for one moment, one more minute, and then we'll ask um, Councillor Hamilton. Um... What I'll do is I'll leave it on so people can go back into it and put it in whenever they want. It'll be on. OK, brilliant. Should should we, um, Catherine, if you can take back control of the screen maybe now and then we can... Um, So I'm just now going to introduce um, my my dear colleague um, Jennifer Samuels, who's a commissioning manager uh, with us at Westminster, and and Jennifer's going to introduce um, uh, Councillor Hamilton and the next uh, the next segment. Can, can I just and, and brilliant? We can see you there, Jenny. Um, Jenny, with uh, our <laughs> our pictorial summary of the event so far. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank Hi, you. 
Thank you, Serena. So it's a great pleasure um, for me to introduce our next guest speaker, the formidable Councillor Paulette Hamilton. Councillor Hamilton has been a Labour councillor in Hamsworth Wood since June 2004. She's also a cabinet member for health and social care in Birmingham City Council. She's been in that role since May 2015. She's also Chair of Birmingham Health and Wellbeing Board and also Vice Chair of the Community Wellbeing Board at the Local Government Association. She also sits on a number of other boards. For me, we cannot know what communities need without better understanding their aspirations, concerns and values. Community engagement can play such an important role in this task. Council Hamilton, we've invited you to speak about her work in the communities and about the health and wellbeing board so thank you councillor hamilton ah uh, thank you so much i hope you haven't built it up too much but i'll <laughs> see if i can just do what has been asked of me can i start by saying you can't do things to people you have to do things with people i'm a low i've been a local councillor for many years and as my role as a local councillor i'm not just there in the community i'm there living working and supporting them and understanding what their needs are so roll on to um, January of this year. And I ed up public health as part of my role with adult social health and care. I also have public health. And for everybody um, who's on this um, conference call today, what got to me in, in as we were getting prepared for COVID. We knew this crisis was coming. We knew there were lots of questions that people were asking in the community. But I have to say, we didn't understand the level of fear that was truly out there in the community until about April. Now, questions I've been asked about figures and it, are the ethnic minority communities being dis disproportionately represented, but anybody that was dealing with this at close hand, the figures were almost impossible to get and everything was retrospective and you couldn't get real-time data and what have you. So then we started to listen to the voice of the community and we had an emergency come up in Birmingham where a young lady went online, I really respect her actually, and she went online and she said, look, no matter what you're feeling, don't use the local hospitals because our people are dying in there. And I was so touched by this um, I, because I'm a nurse by trade. And I, I contacted her, phoned her and I said, well, why have you done this? And she said, um, counsellor, they're killing our people in there. They're killing them. And we, I was getting the same thing coming back from the Asian community as well as the black um, community. So the BAME communities were absolutely gripped with fear. Then between, at the height, between the 11th and 12th of April, people just started dropping around me. People I'd worked with in the Labour Party, my neighbour died, friends were dying that I went to school with. It was just ridiculous. And I literally cried that much over that weekend. I thought something needs to be done. So with what um, this young lady had said, with what we were starting to see coming through in the communities, with my own experience and what have you, I contacted um, one of the chief execs of our, of our local hospitals because I head up the Health and Wellbeing Board and that gave me access so I used it. So I contacted um, the chief exec, who was really good, got back in touch with me straight away. We had a really good chat. I started um, complaining about the lack of data and what have you. Within 12 hours, data was being sent across to us. But it was, uh, I, I don't like this term, but it was dirty data. It needed sorting out so people could understand what it meant. And so... What I want to tell you today is when a community is frightened, you've got to calm them down. So we called the chief medical officer. Well, not we. I called the chief medical officer. I called the public health director who I work with very closely and you're going to hear from um, later. I also asked 
or the chief execs of the two main hospitals to a meeting. And we had a, a meeting in the afternoon and I said to them, look, people need to be educated they need to understand what the issues are because because they're not being educated and even though we're trying to get the messages out there it's not getting to them the fear has built up in the community and um they were brilliant absolutely brilliant so with the the chief exec of the ccg with the the chief execs with the medical directors and what have you, I embarked on a health and wellbeing board meeting because that was the quickest way I knew how to get the information across. We'd just gone, everything had just gone online and basically we, we needed to do it quickly. So we did one of these teams remote meetings. It crashed at just over 400, but I also embarked on um, WhatsApp messages, getting key people, to really get out into the community as well as myself. I went onto the radio, I did television interviews, whoever would listen to me. Mm. I never slept for that week because we literally called the meeting on the Friday for the following Thursday. So I just never slept. I basically, whoever I could call in favors from in the community, I did so. What that led to was for the meeting, we received over 600 questions. We had over 200 people ask over 600 questions, unprecedented, unheard of. But what we were then able to do is group the questions into, into bundles and we were able to then call in all the experts from around the West Midlands to actually answer the questions. We gave them the questions prior to the meeting and I was then able to chair the meeting and to ask the questions. That really went down well because people then started to feel they were being heard. But then I also wrote to the government. So I wrote to Matt Hancock and I said, look, we have seen this as a crisis that's developing in Birmingham. And, you know, how are you going to, what are you going to do about it? We need support, blah, de, blah, de, blah. In the meantime, Matt Hancock came onto the, the television and he then started to recognise through all the deaths in the health service and the care sector that this was a developing issue. And he asked for the PHE to get involved. I thought at that point my work would be done. I didn't realise that was when it would start. Because within, the, within Birmingham, we had already decided prior to everything that had happened that we would be working with Lewisham going forward because of the large number of African and Caribbeans that are in that community and the issues were quite similar to that we were experiencing in Birmingham. So that work was stalled at that point. So we decided that we would carry that on as an answer to the Health and Wellbeing Board because the issues, the health inequalities were so stark and the issues around the African and Caribbean community were proving to be so stark. But you have to look at the wider determinants of health because there's issues around education, where our people live and with the Asian community as well as the African and Caribbean community, the multi-generational households, because I live in a multi-generational household you know I myself and my husband and and our children and they have and one of them they have their child there are six of us in our household so we are multi-generational so there were lots of issues that we needed to look at so I'm trying to get through this quite quickly so what we did was what I did was I wrote to Matt Hancock again and he said he was going to do an, uh, uh, an inquiry, but that soon changed to PHE doing a review. I then met Professor Kevin Fenton, who was by, he was brilliant to be honest, and he listened to over 4,000 people. But what disturbed me was when I saw the very poor report that was then published at the end of it, because even though I'd said we needed the quant, quant we, you know, we'd got the 
quantitative stuff so the figures were there but we didn't really have the qualitative stuff which said what people were going through because me as a counsellor what I was seeing what I was experiencing people I was talking to because another friend of mine her daughter died at childbirth and they were saying it doesn't affect the young she didn't even get to see her son and she died and her son now has got no mom two children left and um, she has no mom. She wasn't old, but they were saying it's only old people that were dying. But I was experiencing something a little bit different. So the work we did with um, then PHE published their report. I was absolutely furious. I couldn't understand how they felt that was acceptable to publish that as something to present to people to work with. So after, I, I can't take credit for any of this because it's a team thing, but after working with Channel 4, Sky and others who did not let up, they did not let up, PHE then published a full report with the recommendations. But then it left me feeling a bit sad because the recommendations bar the ethnicity data are no different to what David Lammy said, to the Stephen Lawrence report, to many reports we've been seeing over the last 30 years, which we know is true. But the fact is we couldn't get the change. But then with um, George Floyd stuff coming through, you're now starting to see leaders actually try to make a difference. But what I'd say here is there isn't enough of us in positions at this moment in time. I truly believe this is a significant time and it will happen. But we have to work in co-production. We have to ensure that our white brothers and sisters absolutely are championing the cause as they do with LGBT, as they do with women issues. Because unless we get we work together to get these changes. I'm worried that they will be pushed back under a carpet, which I'm hoping that every single person in on this call will ensure that that never happens again. Now, as a counsellor, I am passionate. I am absolutely passionate about the issues of our, our BAME community. I am passionate about issues of the black community, but we have to be very strategic. We have to ensure that structures are changed, that the way things are done going forward are changed, that when you get people into position, into positions, they can maintain them because sometimes they put people in just for them to fail. So we have to ensure that people that are in these positions, that we're absolutely supporting them. I absolutely admire what you guys are doing in London. In Birmingham, we've continued, we've continued working with our faith groups, with the different communities, with our women's groups, and we've managed to get things out really quickly, which has helped to allay a lot of the fears but what I would say about COVID, and I'm going to end with a quote, the issue with COVID, a, a large number of our younger community, I keep getting it, did COVID really exist, COVID-19? And I think the confusion that has come from other quarters and things that have happened, our communities are struggling to truly understand the effects the impacts of COVID-19, but and we need to do more work on that because they need to understand that in Birmingham, we lost 1,190 people above the normal deaths that we would have had in this city in the last, in the last four months. So people have died. It has affected families. I remember one minister saying to me, and she's brilliant, she said, April was so bad for me. I lost 15 people, including my husband. She said, I felt like taking a rope, going into the garden and putting it over the tree and just hanging myself. And if it wasn't for my faith, I wouldn't be here today. That's what she said to me. Now I'm going to say a quote and then I'll open it up. Yesterday is not ours to recover, but tomorrow is ours to win 
or lose. We can win this, but we have to work together. Thank you. Oh, oh let me let me let let me just say thank you very much. Your work and your passion and your effort has shown your determination and you are a true leader. Yeah, you let me tell you, you are a true leader. You have shown leadership in this field. I've just got a couple of questions for you, if I may. Just one question for you, if I may. So for all this work you've shown, the Health and Wellbeing Board, yeah, you have driven a lot of what you've done through there, but through your own passion. What would you say for those who haven't got a Health and Wellbeing Board or where the attendance is flagging, what would you say to those people? How can we galvanise that? For me, in organisations, you have. Dip I use the Health and Wellbeing Board because it was a mechanism. It was a vehicle that was available to me. I chaired it, and I knew the leaders across the system. In other organisations, you have your chief execs. You have um, different leaders in different places. We have to ensure we empower them if you haven't got that control. So they work with us to make the difference. That's why I've said co-production is so important. The chief exec of Westminster, he showed the passion. He wants to make the changes, but sometimes some of our leaders, it's not that they don't want to do it, they just don't know how. So sometimes you have to work with them to actually say, if we want to make that difference, this is what we have to do. And I'm, I'm, I don't know if I'm getting too old or what it is, but I don't want to compromise anymore. I want to see more people get to the positions of power before I die. But 20 years from now, there will be another Paulette Hamilton when, when I perhaps am not here anymore or I've gone off to do other things. And there will be somebody else that comes and takes it a little bit further but for me we're at a crossroads today so I have to do what I can to just make the changes but you have to work with others you can't do it on your own because they will just isolate you and snuff you out. Brilliant. Brilliant. Jennifer I just wanted to just draw your attention to Heather she just wanted to uh, come, come okay in. Sorry, I was just going to open it up to the floor now. Sorry, sorry, okay, sorry. I'm just going to open it up to the floor. So, um, Heather, do you want to? Um... Yeah, hi. Hi, Paulette. Um, you must know me, Paulette. I'm a Brummie. I bought Brummie Birmingham to Westminster. And you and I work together at Coke and Mental Health. And Paulette okay. is a real advocate for mental health provision and services, particularly to our communities. And what I've heard today, Paulette, and thank you so much for your time, because I know how busy you are in what you do in Birmingham. Um, but what I've heard today is about being bold. And I'd like to sort of offer and sort of step in in front of Serena and the chief exec, Stuart, really, and offer a link for Birmingham and Westminster. There are so many commonalities between us there are so many there's so much great work that I know I know Birmingham I live you know my family are in Birmingham I'm up and down from the M40 all the time still Paulette so <laughs> Birmingham is still at the heart and the center of my world but I also know a lot about Westminster now and I'd really like to to sort of encourage the hand of strengthening communities and those ties and the support for each other and what we all need now in this time of healing, but also what you've said and what you've talked about, Paula, and that is learning and how we make this better and how we learn from what this terrible crisis has has brought to all of us, you know, families and, um, and communities. So my request today, Paula, is not to say goodbye, but how do we start and continue our relationship? Brilliant. Well, put it this way, Eva, um, 
you know me and you know I'm always open to working with people. Sometimes I don't even know where I find the time, but just God has allowed it because it's my time, as they'd say. So I'm always open to working with people. I have to say I'm in the right place at the right time and I'm able to have the right influences. The leadership in Birmingham are really up for the change, they're up for the challenge, but the community that I serve are also very strong and they know what they want. And for me, as um, someone, and Heather, you're right, I am passionate about a mental health because too many of our black men and women are being taken out prematurely because of mental health and they have no life. And I've always said, without good mental health, you have no health. So you're spot on, re your assumptions of me in that area. But um, we just have to keep working together. We just have to keep talking. You know, this platform of Teams, Zoom, webinar has opened my world. I've got around the country in, 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 in such a short space of time when I wouldn't have been able to do ah. Oh, of what I've been able to do if I had to travel backwards and forwards. So for me, the doors are now open for that joined up work to carry on. So for my ask to you is you, you be bold, ask what you want of me. If I can do it, I will. If I can't, I'll be honest and say I can't. Thank you, definitely, Heather. And we will definitely keep this momentum and this discussion going and thank you so much um councillor hamilton the fact that you had 600 you know questions mm -hmm. at your health and well-being i'm sure we can in initiate that kind of conversations within the community so thank can you I, very can much i also say we answered every single one <laughs> Well, so everything, <laughs> and that's public health. Public health has to be thanked. What they did, they distributed it amongst the partners, and the partners committed to answer every single question, and they did. So every single person that took the time to contact us, we contacted them with a response to their question so that we could reduce the level of fear that was out there. And I can't, as I say, there is no I in team. It was teamwork. It was system, system working. It was partnership working. And we achieved a goal that we set out to achieve. But it also meant keeping the contact with different groups going, which is hard work. Some nights I'm on Zoom or what have you till 10, 11 o'clock and um, the public health director is even worse than me. And he is, so at the end of the day, it takes commitment and work, but the communities will thank you for it. it and also I can't f finish without saying the MPs were brilliant in Birmingham. People like Prick Gill, Khalid Mahmood, Shabana Mahmood, Liam Byrne were brilliant. Whatever I asked of them, they did it. They didn't even question it. They just said, what do you want us to do? So it takes teamwork and it worked the same with the councillors. Whatever I asked of them, they were, they were willing to do it. So this is why I say humbly it was my time because a year ago they might not have listened. Mm -hmm. Six months ago, they might not have done it, yeah. but they have now. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Councillor oh. Hamilton. And you might find the time. You've got lots of uh, lovely supported messages in our chat. So you might find the time just to read through those. Thank you once again. OK, thank you. God bless. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much, uh, Councillor Hamilton. Um, brilliant. And I think you've really shown us and it was brilliant to hear about that collaborative piece with Lewisham. Um, so we can. Yeah, absolutely. We, we want to be part of that. Um, as Heather said, and I think absolutely that's one of the actions that we'll take out of this and and really showing us how you know, um, bridging that kind of political and officer, you know, there was no divide. It was a complete team. So thank you very much for your time and, and thank you for your inspirational words. Um, all on the call, we're just going to take a couple of minutes now um, and reconvene um, maybe at um, 
let's say let's reconvene at 12 minutes i'm just going to be awkward at 12 minutes past uh, 12 and then we can hear from dr justin varney um uh, from birmingham and, and one of the the director of public health that councillor hamilton uh, worked with thank you very much Okay, so it's um, hopefully you've all been able to make a quick cup of tea and uh, um, or have a loo break. Um, so now I'm just going to hand over um, to to my dear colleague uh, Jay Akbar, who's our principal planning solicitor with the Bay Borough um, Legal Services uh, for so that's for um, Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea and Westminster uh, City Council. Just handing over to you, Jay. Thanks, Serena. Um, sorry, my camera's playing up, so I'm not actually um, on video. However, I'll, I'll carry on. So, um, hello all. Kicking off with our first session this afternoon, we are going to cover the topic of creative engagement with communities, and we are so lucky to be joined by Dr Justin Barney, who is the Director of Public Health at Birmingham City Council. 
Um, originally training in general practice, Dr. Varney's career has included roles in the NHS, the local and national government, with an emphasis on building partnerships um, across the public, private and community sector to improve people's health and well-being. Um, Dr. Varney, I hope you can hear me. Um, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and if I can hand over to you now, please. Of course. And and have you got my slides uh, set up or should I share them for mine? Perfect. OK, yeah. excellent. Thank you. So um, I, I think you've already had Councillor Hamilton, so she's probably stolen all my thunder uh, and <laughs> told you a lot. Um, so I'll, I'll go through these reasonably quickly. And then if you use the, the chat box to ask any questions, I can pick those up. Um, so if you can move on to, to the next slide. Um, I thought it would be helpful just to give a, a bit of a uh, kind of overview of what a DPH does in normal times, um, because it just helps bit, give a bit of a context of uh, how we've all pivoted for, for COVID-19. So um, we're chief officers uh, of the council, we're appointed jointly between the council and the secretary of state. And there are three domains of practice. There's health improvement, which is things like physical activity, commissioning smoking cessation, NHS health checks and sexual and reproductive health services. There's usually quite a small part on a day-to-day -day basis, which is health protection, um, which is issues like immunisation, screening, uh, and responding to outbreaks of things like measles or tuberculosis cases. Um, and then there's another small part, which is normally healthcare, public health, which is around kind of quality improvement in commissioning pathways with the NHS. So in normal times, I would say I probably spend less than 10% of my time doing uh, infection control uh, and uh, health protection. And then suddenly, uh, this is now my life and has been my life doing COVID-19 since about January. Um, so there's a, a huge amount that, that's been going on. Um, if we go into the next slide, then during uh, COVID, uh, I'm not sure if the next slide's come. There we go. There's always a time lag on these things as we're all learning digital. Um, so during COVID, the role of the Director of Public Health is predominantly to provide technical advice to members and other officers. There's a lot of data churning as we get more information through from Public Health England and from the NHS test and trace system, um, community engagement, media engagement. Um, you know, in Birmingham, I do a weekly live Q&A for West Midlands BBC, um, which is always a little bit nerve wracking because it's usually eight o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday morning and anyone can ring in and ask me anything. And they do. Um, so, um, but it's really important actually that, that that is being done by someone who has the technical knowledge to be able to answer pretty much any question. Um, and obviously there's also leading the response and now the test and trace response, working across with the NHS um, and other partners. In Birmingham, I have five universities in the city. So we have 87,000 students and five different universities. So quite a lot to... Um, to just think through when you just think about the university situation for us. Um, and then always there's that role of translating whatever national government has said to what does it really mean. And in general, uh, national government have tended to publish guidelines on a Friday evening, uh, usually about six o'clock, and we don't get to see them before they get published. So there's been a lot of quite rapid thinking through what does it, what does the guidance say? And then trying to translate that into what does that really mean for people in language they understand? Um, and that's been quite a lot of work, I think, particularly through the first couple of months of this. So if we could go on to the next slide. So what I wanted to kind of talk through was a bit about some of the engagement we've done. I'm sure Councillor Hamilton's kind of referenced uh, some of the different ways we've been engaging with communities uh, about uh, through COVID and through the outbreak. Um, should say I joined Birmingham in February 2019. So I've been here about 18 months. I'm quite glad I didn't join in February 2020. Um, so I had at least a bit of time to get my feet under the table and build relationships. But 
over this outbreak, we have made huge steps forward in engaging uh, with different communities. You know, we have over 400 different faith settings in the city um, and bringing them together and having conversations with them, uh, moving, working with elected members to get them used to doing uh, ward forums digitally. Um, we have 101 elected members in the council. So it's not an insignificant challenge there. Um, translating national resources, because until recently, very, very little of the national resources was being translated centrally. Um, and we have over 187 different nationalities in the city. So lots of work in terms of direct engagement, then working through media and really thinking about um, kind of the, the traditional media in essence, the radio, the normal press, community radio, but starting to move into spaces like community podcasts. Um, so I remember doing an interview uh, Q&A session for a podcast uh, run by local Muslim students, um, very much targeted towards Muslim community. Um, and that was just an opportunity to to talk to them about their concerns, but to reach a different audience in, in perhaps a non-traditional way or something we haven't done before. Um, if you look at the social media uh, bit, and I would call, say I'm someone who's pretty tech savvy. You know, I've had a Twitter account since it started. I'm on LinkedIn. I do all of those things. Um, through this, I've learned how to do Instagram Live. That's been a learning curve. Um, and we've been doing Instagram Live sessions, particularly focusing on young people. Uh, and it's quite hard to answer the questions when they're scrolling up the screen in front of you uh, and you can't scroll back that you like you can in a Teams chat. Um, we've done Facebook Live uh, with some of our local media platforms that that's their primary output. Um, we've done multilingual sessions, streaming live. So that's been really interesting um, doing Q&As with communities where English isn't their first language, where I'm answering questions so I'm being asked a question in English, I give an answer in English, and then the two presenters have a conversation in a language I don't speak uh, about my answer with the audience. And then they come back with more questions. And it, it's been a really interesting experience for me as someone um, who's very bad at languages um, to sit in a room in which I experience not having the dominant language. Um, and you know, I think that's a really valuable experience. Um, uh, and something I've really enjoyed doing, actually, and we've done now three or four of them in different languages, but it, it was quite a new thing for us to do as a council um, and, and, you know, quite a different way of being. Um, and then we've had the special health and wellbeing board that I'm sure Councillor Hamilton shared. Uh, and I came on just as she was talking about the 600 questions we had to answer. I mean, huge amount of work to do that. But really important, actually, to be able to everyone who took the time to write to us deserves the time to write back to them. And that's a really important piece to do. Um, and we've had the normal statutory meetings going on in public as well, uh, as well as private ones uh, and these community engagement sessions. And if we move on to the, the next slide, you get a sense of some of the numbers. And I was trying to top this up and I was kind of thinking, oh, eight hours is not that much if you think about it. Um, but on the other hand, that's, that's kind of more than one full working day specifically working with our African and Caribbean communities. Um, and that's been in a range of different uh, engagement discussions, online engagement forums with different parts of those communities. And again, I think one of the really important things has been not saying BAME is a single community. I, and even when we get into African and Caribbean community, recognizing they are actually two distinct communities. And within the African community, there are even more diversity. Within the Caribbean, some, but most of our Caribbean community do identify as a Caribbean community. In our African community, there are significant cultural differences and language differences with different parts of those communities. So those eight hours were spread across a range of different groups of different people coming together rather than the same group coming together eight times. And that again has been quite a learning journey, I think for us as, as a council about how we build networks, how we find people that can help connect us. So, for example, one of those groups, which was specifically with African community leaders, 
came about because in our um, black churches group, the majority of the black church le leaders were from uh, Caribbean church groups and the African church leaders were there, but they felt that there were some elements that weren't being heard by their community. Some of that was about language as well. So they set up a very specific meeting and said, could you come? And I went, yeah, because as Councillor Hamilton highlighted, it's easy enough for me to log in from my sitting room and join uh, and do another, you know, another set of conversations. And it's really helped, I think, in terms of access. Similarly, in our South Asian community, we've done distinct sessions with our Bangladeshi community. We've also done some distinct gendered sessions. So we've done specific sessions uh, with Bangladeshi women's groups and, and community leaders and Bangladeshi men's groups separately. And that's been at the request of the women who felt that often some of these conversations are just dominated by men uh, and they wanted to have a space for themselves to be able to ask me questions directly. Um, we've done loads with faith community settings. I have a weekly meeting uh, well, up until two weeks ago, every week I was meeting the mosques of the city every Monday morning and the black churches every Tuesday and then the interfaith group every Thursday. Uh, and we're gradually moving them to an interfaith meeting one week and the other week I meet the, the group separately. Um, but that's been important because there are different issues in different faith communities. Um, and one of the things that's really come through recently is how um, challenging the regulations about not being able to sing has been for particularly our African churches um, where it's not an issue for our mosques in the same way. And that's that's a really important thing to just highlight because too often we think, well, faith settings are all the same. And actually, um, particularly when we think about Christian faith settings, where they all have the same response. And actually they don't. In different communities of faith, different elements of celebrating religion and faith have different emphasis and that singing one has become a real point of contention uh, for some of our faith leaders about them feeling that their way of marking their religion is being set apart and they're being disadvantaged compared to other faiths and working with them on that has been important. Um, we've worked with our Chamber of Commerce. We have an Asian Chamber of Commerce, which is a, a kind of partner agency of the overall chamber, who were funded through our LEP to run a multilingual helpline for businesses uh, in predominantly South Asian languages and some European languages. And that's fantastic because if you've tried to read the 51 pages of restaurant guidance, they're not easy if you speak fluent English. So actually how we expect people who don't, um, have English as a first language to navigate that it is quite challenging. So that that was an important bit to do. We've done some sessions with the migrant refugee health champions. Um, we've got quite a lot of asylum dispersal centres in the city. So this is a good way of getting in to answer questions from people who are working on the front line with these communities. We've done similar things with our homeless sector as well. Um, We've had sessions with our LGBT community, um, you know, and I think it's really important that that we you know we do ensure that we do this for all communities and not just our ethnic communities or just our faith communities. We've tried to do it across the patch. Um, our LGBT communities raised with us um, a particular dimension of bereavement that for some of their community members, they were losing parents when they weren't able to see them. They weren't able to have conversations before they died um, to try and process where they had difficult family relationships. So they might be in a situation where their parents had never accepted the fact they were gay and they were being rung up and said, you know, your dad's on his last, last uh, few days. Um, you can have a telephone conversation or a Zoom chat to say goodbye. And that's not a conversation you can do easily. And they were really feeling that, actually. And it was a really useful thing for them to be able to share that, because then we could think, what could we do in bereavement services differently? Um, we've done a lot with, with young people. That's where I've learned to do Instagram Live. Um, um, but it's been, again, a, a powerful, important thing to give young people a chance to ask questions directly of me um, uh, as the person leading this from a technical side from the city. Um, 
and we've done you know quite a few of those now and i think it's been really important the the final two bits i'll just pick up on this slide is one we commissioned um a community partner organizations to work with us uh, and i'll touch on an example of one of those coming up but it's been quite important to actually put some money into the community as well um and we focused that on communities that we knew we would have either linguistic challenges with or we had particular concerns about um, and they've helped us both by disseminating information through their formal and informal routes um, facilitating conversations so the Chinese Community Centre for example on Sunday did a, a session which I joined them for with uh, young Chinese people under 35 to answer their questions and their concerns about COVID at the moment which was really great the other thing is we've thought about engagement with staff. So every week I log on for an hour and do an hour of Q&A on our Yammer platform, which is internal. I average about 60 questions an hour. Um, and we range anywhere from 40 staff being on at, during that hour to two to 300. And it's varied throughout the outbreak how many are on. Um, but that's, uh, that's on the platform. So people can go back and read the questions. Um, and um, that's been really important. We've also done specific sessions for some of our staff network groups. So like our ethnic staff network group uh, have had a specific uh, Q&A session with me. Um, and I've also done that for some of our statutory partners. So our Children's Trust, I did work, I've did. i done two for them in the last week, specifically with, with BAME staff. So it's been interesting. And, and the, enge the level of engagement has varied uh, with these. So in Instagram, uh, I would say we're looking at uh, between 20 and uh, 150 people watching in the hour that I'm doing the questions. Um, and then, you know, the Teams meetings and the Zoom calls with mosques, some weeks 12, 14 of them turn up, some weeks 200 of them turn up. Um, the, the other thing is these things are always recorded. So we've, we've made a real commitment that we record the meetings and that particularly in the community groups has been really important because they've, they've been shared quite widely. Um, I know that because I get questions from people I've never met who come back and went, you said this in this meeting, uh, you know, and I know they weren't in the meeting. Um, what did you mean? So we, we've that, ability to record this type of session and share it ha has helped uh, a lot um, and that's been promoted by the community groups that we're working with directly themselves so it's been quite an important part of this but I think I did want to highlight that staff element I mean we have about 13,000 staff in the council it's not perfect because some of our staff don't have access to computers and one of the things we're very conscious of is digital exclusion that's why we do the live radio stuff as well, to enable people that listen to the radio and dial in to be able to give them opportunities to ask questions as well. So we just go on to the next slide. That would be great. And uh, I think you've already covered quite a lot on, on what's going on with the Special Health and Wellbeing Board. So uh, we skip over this and go on to the next one, but it's there for posterity because it was such a huge amount of work. Um, but I think a really important one, and, and we have throughout our Health and Wellbeing Boards had um, the opportunity for the public to submit public questions, um, something Council Hamilton feels very strongly about. Um, and we've done a similar thing for our local outbreak engagement board, actually, with public questions as well. Um, so and some of those questions are really challenging. Um, I think one of the things you have to kind of prepare yourself is when you open to this kind of open Q&A, um, you get asked things that aren't easy to answer or aren't comfortable to answer. But it's better to try and, and, uh, and even to respond and say, I don't have an answer for that at the moment either because we don't know or because I need to take it away and think about it, but I can come back to you and I will at the next meeting with a more robust answer. So that's okay. If we move on to the, the next uh, slide, that would be great. So what I wanted to do is now just give you a, a couple of quick examples of um, two things that we've done. Um, uh, sorry, one thing that we've done as well, which is we did an online uh, survey 
for uh, to capture from residents their experiences during COVID. And we've got about two and a half thousand people have completed it so far. But what you can see from that tiny little graph on the right is that the ethnic representation is less than the ethnic diversity of the city. So what we've also done is worked with our community partners and uh, in the blurry picture, you can see just about see Chinese community centre next to some Chinese uh, characters. Uh, they're one of our commissioned community partners. So what they did is they created a uh, sub a version of the survey where they took some of the key questions uh, and they translated those along with other questions they wanted to ask and they were integrated. So we're able to have our overall sample and then we have specific um, parallel samples from particular communities where um, particularly language is a barrier, but our LGBT community has already done this uh, as well. And they've got comparative questions, which I think is a, a really helpful way of doing it. So on to the, the final slide now, if you could, which is just some reflections uh, on coulda, woulda, shoulda. Uh, I suppose, um, you know, the, the uh, unprecedented is a, a much overused word in these times, but you, I trained for a pandemic. I never thought I'd see one in my lifetime. Uh, and this is despite having spent part of my career specify, specifically working on pandemic flu. Um, and hindsight's really important, is valuable, but it's really important to be generous in our compassion and our reflection that there are some things we know today that we didn't know two months ago. So particularly when we look around the differentials in death uh, for people with COVID, much of which are linked to chronic disease, obesity and smoking, um, we just didn't know that in April. Um, we weren't getting the data, the day, you know, actually analysing death data is incredibly difficult to do properly. Uh, and robustly. So, you know, hindsight's useful, but it's important not to point fingers with it. Um, engagement's time consuming. I think on average, I do between seven and 12 hours a week of live Q&As in one form or the other. I've joined you today a little bit late because I've just come from a Q&A session with uh, ethnic uh, community staff for Ernst Young nationally, who asked me to do a Q&A session for them. Um, so, and I'm going on tonight to do uh, three ward forums back to back uh, to talk to different groups of residents. And but it's time well spent, and it, it's one of the reasons. You know, Birmingham's had a reasonable ride of COVID. We've got just over 1.2 million citizens. Um, you know, we could have. We've got some of the most deprived areas in the country. We have some of the most ethnically diverse. Uh, populations we could have been hit a lot harder than we have been and I think some of what we're doing is has helped with that it's important to be humble and authentic um, I've done a vertical learning curve around um, the Islamic faith particularly around funeral rites and all sorts of other bits and pieces <clears throat> every every week they teach me something new which is really helpful um, it's important to recognize the history uh, and particularly some of the anger and the frustration. Many of these communities um, have been consulted before. Um, for those of you who can't see my camera, that was a virtual inverted commas on either side of it. Um, but they're used to being asked in a tokenistic way to express an opinion and then not not responded to. Um, and that's where the special board was so important is People were saying we've got concerns and we said, fine, we'll do this in a public forum where we're accountable, not in a closed room. Let, let's air them. Let's talk about it. And, and that has been really, really important. Um, it's important that, that engagement is done by people who can really answer the questions. I don't put up junior staff to do these engagement sessions. It's not fair on them. It's not fair on communities. If it's not me, it's one of my consultants. Um, but the vast majority of the time I will do this because it's about respect for the communities. They're taking the time to meet with me. I need to take the time to meet with them and hear what they're saying as well as um, tell them and, and share with them what I need to. And finally, it's important to look at who isn't in the room. Mm. Um, and that African and Caribbean example is a good example of that. You know, I think there are many communities we still need to do more work to reach. Um, 
you know, when we looked at our Central and Eastern European community, I think historically we'd always tick the box because we've got a good relationship with our Polish community uh, and forgotten about the other hundred or so ethnic identities that exist in Central and Eastern Europe who've got quite different cultural uh, backgrounds and experiences. Um, so we've really had to work on that and reflect on who isn't there and, and reach out and engage. And sometimes... Uh, people say no. So, for example, our Irish community, we reached out and went, do you want to have a meeting? And they went, no, it's fine. We're, we're happy. We know what we're doing. We, do, we, you know, we know how to get hold of you if we want to. That's OK. But we made the offer. And I think that's a really important thing as well. Um, you know, uh, as someone was posting in the chat, you know, there aren't hard to reach. There are e the communities that are easy to, to ignore. Um, and the important bit is being cognizant and alert to that. So I'll finish there and I'm happy to take any questions that you'd like to raise. Thank you so much, um, Justin. I think um, absolutely brilliant. And to kind of see the, the work that, um, you know, from public health and, and uh, in terms of Councillor Hamilton that you've been delivering across uh, Birmingham is is just really, really inspiring um, for us. And, and I'm sure, and I've seen from the chat, much uh, learning for us to, um, to take away. So we thank you really, uh, and, and, and for taking time out, we know you're literally running between meetings. So thank you so much um, for, for, for joining us today. I think just in terms of, um, I know there are some questions in the chat and Justin, I don't know how long you can um, stay today. We will be having an open discussion forum a little bit later, um, but just maybe in the interest of um, trying to kind of keep, keep to the agenda, if I, um, uh, hand over now um, to uh, my colleague Sharma, Sharma Suta Smith, who is Programme Director for Harrow Road Regeneration in North Westminster. And Sharma is going to um, uh, introduce uh, our next speaker. So thank you very much, um, Justin, and we'll uh, speak with you again soon. Thanks, Sharma. Are we ready or can can people hear me? Just just one minute, Peter. I just want to um Oh sorry. There we are. Yeah, <laughs> hi. Yeah. Hi. So I'm just here to introduce Peter. Uh Peter's the founder and chief exec of Support When It Matters or SWIM. Um, and this is a hackney-based community interest company. Uh SWIM helps people to make positive changes in their life, rebuild family relationships, access education and employment. Um, Peter's been doing some assertive outreach in Hackney uh, and we've recently asked him to come and work with us in some of our regeneration areas in Westminster, in particular in Harrow Road and Church Street. So I won't speak anymore, I'll let Peter take the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Just before we start, Sharma, are you going to control the slides? Right, great. Okay. Um, can everybody hear me? Can you just put your hand up if you can hear me? Great stuff. Okay, first and foremost, um, Serena, thank you very much from the bottom of my heart for giving us a platform and giving us the opportunity to come along and talk about what we are so passionate about in terms of uh, community engagement. Um, my name is Peter Merrifield. My background is um, in managing health and social care services with a particular focus on criminal justice, dual diagnosis, substance misuse, and young people services. And our presentation is going to be is going to be jointly done with Dan, who is going to um, uh, sorry, is that please use the invite? Is that me? Oh yeah, so so Dan's going to join me on this on this presentation, and what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about the COVID nineteen assertive outreach program that um, Swim undertook. So can we move to the next slide? Uh, can we bring up the rest of the text on that slide? I think we need to do a couple more clicks. Right. 
Okay, so I think uh, Sharma already talked about that. That's it. So as I've mentioned, um, our mission is to sort, support people in the local community, and we do have an emphasis, but not solely, on working with the BAME community. Um, as I've already mentioned, uh, criminal justice is a key area, but also things around working in primary care and tackling the digital divide is an area that we are particularly interested in and want to work in. Can we move to the next slide? So, um, as I said, um, SWIM came about, not yet, if we can hold fire on this one, yeah, SWIM came about um, last year, August, um, because having spent many years working in health and social care, and particularly in criminal justice and substance misuse, it became really apparent to me that there was a, a real challenge in engaging older black men who um, are disproportionately represented within the prison services, mental health services, there seemed to be a real breakdown in engagement and, and how should we say, culturally sensitive psychosocial interventions for this group. Um, with that in mind, I decided that I was going to employ something which my father told me back in the 80s when we would be sitting down uh, discussing politics, drinking our Coxburgh rum, and really having an enjoyable family debate. And my father used to say to me, Peter, if you feel so strongly about something, go and do something about it. And those words have resonated with, with me for the last 30 odd years that um, you can't be a spectator, you can't be in the stands on this type of thing, you need to get onto the pitch. Um, and what I noticed is when COVID came and disrupted all what we were doing, I was hugely disappointed in the narrative that I saw coming through the media about the disproportionate effect on the BAME community and this continued referral to underlying conditions, which kind of gave the impression that we are the makers of our own problem and that, you know, it's because we have all of these problems why we're actually disproportionately dying. And what I noticed was there was a real gap in actually any voices coming from the community about, firstly, how it was affecting them, and secondly, what they thought what needed to be done in order to build resilience within the community and reduce the risk. So I made a decision with my father's words ringing in my head that I was going to dip into my own pocket and actually bring together a team and go out in Hackney and pitch up at various thoroughfares and actually engage with my community. I'm going to talk to my community and find out what their views are. Just before we move on to the next slide, um, uh, The Guardian got word of what we were doing and they came along and they were interested and they did a feature and a video. And, and I think that video sums up in about one minute everything I could tell you. So if you don't mind, we can now click on to this video. Um, have you got the sound, uh, sorry, have you got the sound on your end um, enabled? I think you need to enable the system audio on your end. No, you need to go back, uh, enable the system audio on your end, which is a button on the left, I think. Just, yeah, I think we're just gonna we're just gonna do that, um, Peter, because we've been flipping between screens, but we'll get it back up. Just uh, one moment. Yeah. And brilliant, brilliant Jenny there to see uh, how our summary, our illustrative summary is coming along. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it's looking really good. It's uh, certainly looking good. So hang on a minute. Oh. I think there should be a, a button towards the left when you're sharing, which says system um, audio settings. It's just 
the, the event's been going so amazingly. You know, yeah, it's, it's, I, it's, I, I, I did actually send some emails just trying to remind everybody to make yeah, sure that box, yeah. box is checked. Yeah, no, 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 that's that's fine, that's fine. I think also the, the bandwidth sometimes when we're trying to uh, reshare stuff. So just just one moment and we'll, um, we'll be back. I can see that there's quite a few um, just comments. And thank you so much, Justin. I can see you're answering questions there um, in the chat function. Um, really, really good. Uh, what to do? Are you not able to see that button? No, it's not that. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I can't, my mute is everything sticking. So I just need everything oh, okay. to just stop for a minute and I'll try and get my function bar to come back up. Sorry, one second, sorry. <laughs> I wonder if I might just try and share it in the meantime. Yeah, I'm trying to, because I've got it um, up there separately as well, just as a backup. So let me just try and get get myself back up and running with it, sorry. That's all right, don't, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I did actually tick it, so I do. I do yeah. know to tick it, but it, they mm -hmm. gave me an error message. So just one <laughs> second. <laughs> okay. um, just, Justin, I wonder just while we're waiting um, for this, if you might um, ju just thinking, and then we can maybe uh, finish up your section on the on the video. But just you know, kind of other uh, points that you wanted to bring forward, maybe from the presentation, and then we can maybe watch the video and then hand over to to Dan afterwards. Is there? Mm -hmm. Peter, is is there? Oh, <laughs> oh was you? Um, I, was you waiting? You referring to me? Yeah, I was just saying if there's anything, just just while we're um, having our break here. I, yeah, I I think one of the things which which became really pertinent and and was so so significant to us was that there was a degree of reticence and a degree of suspicion within the community, but once we actually and uh, engage with them and we knew how to culturally engage and give people space we found that people had so much information they wanted to share and because they hadn't never got a platform or or got a space to be able to do that it was even difficult to to sort of close it down in a respectful way so mm -hmm. we were able to really get that kind of nuance information that even a survey couldn't pick up and, you know, the sorts of things around people's hurt feelings, you know, uh, around, you know, the, the, the disrespect for the commitment that our generations, our previous generations have given to the country, things like Windrush, you know, all of these things started to also feed into how people were feeling, was feeling. And, and that was really useful information. People were saying things like, we... We, we haven't seen anybody come out and do anything like this. So um, that was really useful information. And of course, as we go through the slide, we'll have a look at what the feedback was and, um, and, and you know, the, the sort of important areas and next steps. I can see you're still struggling with that. Uh... Yeah, I'm getting an error message with the system audio. So what I might do is I'm going to share it um, at the end of your presentation, if I can, just to give me a second. OK. Sorry about that. It's that's just fine. it's that's just fine. doesn't it, it's too many people on the call. Yeah, <laughs> Basically. Yeah, right. Microsoft. Where's Microsoft? Yeah, yeah. No, thank you, Catherine. Um, so um, uh, what, what, what I might just try and do just to enable you um, with your, let me just try and share the copy that I have. Um, uh, sorry, one moment. Let me just enable. Hopefully I'm sharing the right screen. But um, also, Peter, I'm thinking, you know, what you were saying about um, the anger within the community, that absolutely feeds in with what Justin was just speaking yeah. about, you know, and that kind of frustration. And unless we allow that out and, and understand that, then... Um... Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, so, yeah, when you're ready, if you can go back Catherine, up. is that you? You're back up on the screen, are you? Yeah.
while we're waiting, Peter, would it would you perhaps tell us some of the things that people said to you? Yeah. So if you move down down to the the slide, is it slide number twenty six on on your side? I can see the the next slide down. Yes. So what, what we did as part of our strategy to ensure that we, we got the important bit, bit, which was to actually have the conversation, we kept the questions really relatively high level. We didn't include too many um, in order to put people off. But uh, so we asked, you know, a simple set of five questions. And if we move along to the next slide, we start to get some interesting feedback on, on what people's uh, comments were. So, as you can see here, um, we asked the question, you know, have you or a member of your family been affected by COVID? And if you look at the blue segment, you can see that a significant number of people said they hadn't been there. But however, if you look at the, the green and the, the, the amber colour, there was something like 20%. So 20% of the 190 people we spoke to had had a member directly in their family affected by COVID. Now, I, would I do know, in fact, that that is significantly disproportionate to the national average. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's reinforcing what a lot of what we already know, but coming straight from the public that this is really something that is having um, a serious impact. Um, question two, you know, I have a background in primary care and obviously primary care being the front door of the health service for most people, that's what they know as their GP being the first place that you go. And when we ask people, you know, what information you had received from your GP around the impact of COVID on the BAME community, so it's quite specific, Nearly 70% and two thirds of the people said they actually hadn't had no information from their primary, from their GP. Now, there, there could be a number of reasons for that. And for me, there is something around how we support primary care to better communicate and engage and use their, their, their patient list to extract the actual individuals who are directly within this higher risk group and put together some tailored um, uh, responses, um, support. Okay, if we move on to the next slide. Right, um, none of you, well, I shouldn't say this, but I think it's probably true. We asked people about their satisfaction with the way in which the government has been managing the COVID um, pandemic in relation to the BAME community. And as you can see, two thirds of the people, people are polled actually said they were very dissatisfied. And further on, in the section which refers to their comments, you will see what sorts of things they were dissatisfied with. Um, so, and then our next one was around um, personal protection and what people were doing to protect themselves. And I think this is particularly important. And we asked this question because again, the, the tone coming through the media is that there's a degree of irresponsibility. Maybe people, you know, I heard things like people are not washing their hands enough in the BAME community. There is all of this type of uh, nuance, the themes that may have been coming through. And when we ask people about protection, as you can see, 90% of people were actually taking all of the measures that they could take, i.e. masks, gloves and all the rest of it to try and protect themselves and i suppose the the concerning factor though that being said is that you know 10 percent of the population were saying things like they're not doing anything so there were feedback around people saying that it's a conspiracy you know um you need to um just have faith and that will generally do it it's about the type of food you eat. And these are all particularly interesting 
uh, opinions that I think healthcare providers and healthcare designers need to take into account that people seriously have these views and they they shouldn't be dismissed. You know, they are there are legitimate views and that we need to think about how do we still engage with people who have such um, uh, views which may, could make it difficult to engage them into healthcare. All right, so if we move on to the next slide. Right, so question five was, what do you think actually needs to be done to correct things? And this was probably the one that provided, um, uh, you know, some of the best information. And, the, you know, by, by a long chalk, people felt that communication and information was a big problem and that that needed to be improved. Um, they were concerned about the quality of communication, the inconsistencies in the messaging coming through, um, the unreliability. You know, people talked about there being a need for obviously more PPE. And one of the things that we did when we actually set out our stall is we actually prepared 200 pre-packed packs of PPE, which had gloves, masks, sanitizers and so forth, which we gave out to the population. And they were extremely grateful to have these little packs of PPE that they could take home and just provide some extra protection. Um, again, um, mistrust of the government, that was significant. Not trusting the information coming out. Uh, we also had um, things around community initiatives. So people were saying, we want to see more organisations like you coming out and talking to us. And one of the really the group opens the door right to really engaging with the population if not only covid related issues but things around it could be things around the digital divide uh test and trace you know uh, so that was the nuance in the okay. if we move on to the next one peter can you see that i think your um connection seems to yeah are we there yep yeah. Yeah, we got you back. Just see the outcomes. Yeah. Hi. Can you? Hi, everyone. Can I just ask that people turn Let's the go, cameras yeah, off want... just to allow him right. to to it's just have his. Thirty, off. I think. Yeah, if that's okay. Okay, P Peter, are you able to see that now? We might have to move on to Dan if you can't. Dan, I wonder if um, you you wouldn't mind uh, c coming in now. Uh, yes. Okay. Can everyone hear me? I've turned my we camera. Can. Yeah. Yeah, we can, Dan. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, so, uh, I mean, I just wanted to say how inspiring the work of Swim is and That's and right. Peter's initiative. We, we, so actually, what we. Go on, Dan. Sorry, I think, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so I just want to say how, how inspiring the initiative is, uh, you know, that it really represents, you know, everything that's best about what we're trying to achieve in City and Hackney, which is to work from the grassroots up. And here's a grassroots initiative. It's, it's, it's within the community uh, and it's the community 
reaching itself or the community I should say the communities because I think one of the I mean as, as a point was being raised one of the one of the challenges of um, African and Caribbean heritage communities is the complexity um, which is um, you know both uh, you know something that uh, provides a kind of diversity and richness but it's much more complex in terms of reaching than for example reaching our Turkish Kurdish communities we have a single organization it's very easy to to reach the community Orthodox Jewish we have sort of one main organization again it, it, it and, and, the, and most of our Orthodox Jewish population are located in the north of Hackney um, but we're talking about lots of lots of different communities here um, but there's there is a commonality um, and uh, and a common experience and a common experience and I think that's been um, you know exemplified by the BLM movement uh, and and also the COVID crisis as well so um, you know this is this is a really important um, um, initiative and I think the other thing that this this forms part of work within um, alliances in City and Hackney so I just want to say that um, that we're wanting this initiative to continue as part of um, a whole pathway framework that takes place within the Psychological Therapies Alliance. And that brings together a whole range of providers. So Peter was talking about you know, the need to work with primary care. There's also other third sector organisations. So other cultural groups, for example, MIND provide an IRE MIND service, which is for African and Caribbean communities. Um, and, and that links I remind also provides its own IAP service, um, and you know, and that that IAP service reflects the needs of the communities, um, you know, and 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 certain kind of preferences around treatments and and the way things things are done, um, uh, and so that's very important as well. So I think it's it's about this this kind of outreach work. Um, it, there is there is simply no substitute for it really. Um, but 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 for us to make it even more successful and even more um, effective, um, what's really important is it takes place as part of a sort of collaborative approach, uh, and our structure for doing that is is alliances um, and, the, and the psychological therapies alliance being one of them, and that provides all the links along the pathways, and our ultimate goal really is to ensure that. Um, that people from African and Caribbean heritage communities enter mental health services a lot earlier than they do at the moment. Um, so, you know, we, we find that, that, that people in the community actually do very well in terms of recovery rates and everything, but there is still an issue around, particularly men, um, coming into the service late. Um, and it's not just, I mean, I would say this, this has been a problem with other communities as well. The Turkish Kur Kurdish community we had huge issues. Um, but to some extent, we've turned that around. Um, so I think this, this, what I'm trying to say is this all forms part of a, a wider initiative. Um, great, thank you. Thank you so much, Dan and Peter. Um, Peter, I'm so sorry that we lost you in your flow. Um, I think what I found really inspiring about Peter's work is that he just got up and, and got out there and had those conversations. And I think that's what's um, so important is to be having those conversations with people um, and not sitting in a room talking about what other people need. Um, and so I'm really excited to be working with uh, SWIM going forward. Um, we're sort of pushing it for time. So what we'll do is we'll share these slides and also um, perhaps the video um, in the feedback um, that we send to everyone who's attended. Uh, and if we could now please um, move on to Christine Mead. Yeah. Oh, hi everyone. I'm just going to introduce um, Dr. Connie uh, Jungens, who's going to talk about vaccinations. It's one of the biggest comments we've had back from our communities is uh, what's happening with a vaccine. Will it be safe? Will everybody be forced to, to take it? And uh, Connie is a GP. Uh, she's also an epidemiologist with us, with us in our public health department here in Westminster, and she works with Imperial College. So um, Connie, over to you. Thank you very much for inviting me to, to give this talk today, and I'm going to try and re be really brief. Um, 
I'm I'm going to talk about vaccines and I'm not going to assume any prior knowledge. So um, if, if some of this seems a bit noddy, then I, I apologise and also apologies to Christine and Peter who've heard me give this talk last week. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of what, what are vaccines, um, uh, what are the side effects, um, are they safe, and then address a little bit around um, uh, vaccines for different um, ethnicities, etc. Uh, at the end, so hopefully I, I won't. Um, I'll, I'll also talk a bit about the COVID vaccine development uh, very briefly, and then hopefully give you the tools to decide for yourself whether you should have the vaccine or not. Um, not going to. Um, yeah. So uh, can we go back a slide, please? Uh, the next one. Oh, um, so there's a slide missing here that, that was um, I was going to tell you about the um, history of of the vaccine. So um, Edward Jenner was uh, credited with um, uh, developing the vaccine for smallpox, and that's where the name comes from. But actually, um, sorry, um, my slides are rushing ahead. <laughs> um, but the the vaccine actually um, pre precursors of the vaccine have been around for much longer than that. So in the 10th century, the Chinese and the Indians were already using um, a, a kind of a primitive form of vaccine. So in China, they used to crush up um, smallpox uh, scabs and then breathe them through the nose, and that um, they discovered that that um, inferred some immunity to smallpox. And in India, they made incisions in the skin and uh, put a little bit of pus from a wound in it with a bandage over it, and and found that that helped. Um, and even far back um, in, in Greece, it was documented that people had survived uh, the smallpox um, uh, pandemic, uh, uh, smallpox were, were immune later on. So um, so how how do vaccines work? They they basically what, what happens is that we're we're exposed to viruses and bacteria by the millions every day and um, our body deals with them very effectively uh, the first line of defense is the macrophages they're they're killer cells that roam the body and whenever they see an invader they um, they get rid of that but sometimes it takes a little bit more of a um, coordinated um, response because because say a virus is replicating very fast then the the white cells get called in and they produce antibodies and these antibodies are then um, stopping the virus or bacteria from replicating and um, and then uh, this is this is how the body has a tool to to um, deal with a virus when it comes around again so why won't we let the body do naturally sort of what what vaccines do why why do we not let the body get on with infections and the reason for that is that um, a vaccine uses weakened or or dead uh, virus to um, stimulate an antibody production whereas if you have um a, a live virus it takes time to make that antibody. So, so it takes about a week for IgM antibodies to be reduced, uh, produced, and then about two weeks for permanent antibodies to be reduced that, that confer long-term protection. So, um, so what what is in a vaccine? So we've got uh, dead or weakened antigen, like I just said. Uh, then adjuvants, so inflammatory agents, and they're actually meant to be there to to stimulate the the uh, the immunity because sometimes a weakened antibody doesn't get your body interested. So so you need a little bit more of an inflammatory uh, process, and then the immune system gets aroused. So um, preservatives like mercury were previously put into the vaccine, but they are no longer added or drastically reduced. So they're still in the quadrivalent flu vaccine, but, um, but you would have much more of a mercury exposure eating a can of tuna than you would having one vaccine. And then they contain traces of detergents, pathogen killing chemicals, stabilizers like gelatine or other bovine products, fragments of dead organisms. And that has also um, uh, stimulated um, controversy controversy in the past because of the, uh, especially the Muslim community around um, bovine products, etc. Can we move on to the next slide, please?
So I don't know if you uh, remember this, but my my dad is um, in his late 70s and he said every time he came back from the summer holidays, there would be somebody else who lost a limb due to polio. So this is polio and it was a very common picture, the middle one in 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 those times when, when he went to school. We don't see this anymore. Um, there are still cases around, so in India, uh, we could see it until until recently, but um, a lot of people who are against vaccines will um, show you the graph at the top that I've um, shown there to say, well, those diseases are on their way out anyway, uh, and you can see that it's probably due to increased hygiene, etc., and um, and the, the vaccine actually didn't make much difference to that curve. But when you look at the bottom graph, you can see when it's not smoothed, what, what really is going on. So whilst it's true that um, those uh, some of those diseases have been going down, um, there have been frequent outbreaks and um, those outbreaks were stopped um, once the vaccines were widely introduced. And um, I'm hoping with this talk today that um, I, it's, I, I was going to um, call this slide Brexit, actually, because um, it polarizes opinion so much, um, vaccines. So, the, you know, you've got the Ramonas and the quitters and you've got the anti-vaxxers and the big pharma uh, supporters. But actually, most of us are probably in between somewhere sort of trying to decide what, what's right. And, and the discussion is more nuanced. And we've had some really good talks this morning about increasing communication and, and a kind of really intelligent um, honest dialogue about things and I think that's where we need to move to as a community. Can I have my next slide please? So are vaccines safe and how do we know that they are safe? Um, so so vaccines actually take a really, really long time to develop uh, in, in, in relative terms. And it's a very rigorous process, which also means that the research and development uh, process at pharma companies is, is very expensive because only 7% make it through the preclinical stages. So um, so that's, it's like phase three doesn't doesn't really uh, involve any any kind of people. And then the clinical stage where it gets trialed in a small number of people and then a larger one before it actually goes out, uh, only 20% make it through that clinical stage. And, and also to say not every vaccine is the same. So, so they vary in effectiveness, the risk benefit equation is different. So I think nobody would argue that you'd rather have your, your child immunized against polio than um, risking the small chance that they might end up uh, disabled. Um, but, you know, this might not be the same for a BCG vaccine, for example, where we know that it's not that effective and in areas of low prevalence, is it of, of that much value? So um, the, the same with the flu vaccine. So the flu vaccine varies every year by efficacy, and that's because um, in the beginning of the year, scientists are trying to predict which flu strains uh, might come around by the end of the year. And sometimes they get it right, sometimes they get it wrong, but it is really important um, that we that we have it. Um, can I have my like, next slide, please? So what are the side effects of the vaccines? Um, most of them have mainly mild irritation and often that's actually wanted. So I talked about the adjuvant causing a bit of a local irritation to, to stimulate the immune system. And that's what a lot of people will see. You're 100 times more likely to be struck by lightning than suffering a serious side effect from an established vaccine. But um, it is recognized that in some people, and I can't always be predicted, there will be a severe and life-changing response to a vaccine and therefore we have a vaccine compensation program where people who may be affected by this will be um, will be protected and covered and that is all throughout Europe. Um, vaccines change so it's a it's a changing debate as well so so there are less antigens now in the vaccines that they used to be previously. We've removed or reduced preservatives um, from them, but it's also true that we're giving more vaccines now that we have in the past. So uh, babies are now getting sort of seven strains of disease in, in one um, vaccine. And you can understand the concern of some some of the uh, some parents that, you know, it might overwhelm a child's immune system. But we know that the immune system deals with um, millions of bugs every day and that actually um, 
theoretically a child could deal with 10,000 at the same time. So, um, so in, in those terms, they're relatively safe. And we don't know about the long term side effects. So um, some there are some theories that this could be because of um, that the having these vaccines uh, causes an increase in allergy. And it's very difficult to pick apart what's vaccine and what's an in improvement in hygiene, etc. So research is needed on that and um, we need to see. Next slide, please. So how do we know that vaccines work for everyone? And actually, I want to there, there, there is a case for personalized or at least ethnicity or gender based medicine. Um, it is no secret that um, medicine is largely based around white men. Uh, so in, in medicines, we know that um, randomized controlled trials are often carried out in uh, men and women are often excluded from the trial because of their childbearing potential. We know that older people or people with comorbidities don't get um, to take part in trials. And then the findings from the trials then get rolled out to everybody. And we know that medicines are uh, of different efficacy in, in uh, different ethnicities. So ACE inhibitors are not as effective in um, driving down high blood pressure in the Afro-Caribbean community, for example. And um, this is the same for vaccines. So so um, I'm not going to go into big detail here, but um, because of time, but we know that um, from American studies that um, Gardasil, which is the vaccine given for cervical cancer, was not as effective in Afro-American women. And when they looked into the reason for this, what they found was that um, the Gardasil covers two main strains uh, for HPV 16 and 18, which are the, the most common viruses, but actually Afro-American women had had other strains uh, that weren't covered by the vaccine. So um, flu vaccine shown not to be as effective um, as they, in rubella response, it's the other way around. So um, Afro-Caribbean uh, um, patients were more responsive to the rubella vaccine. And then, of course, there is different populations. So the rotavirus vaccine found to be very effective um, where it was developed in um, in Europe in about 80% of uh, children when they deployed it in Africa it was about 60%. So um, there are challenges with um, personalized or in ethnicity and gender based medicine mm -hmm. in that um, we haven't even got good categories of ethnicity. We've heard from um, Dr. Varney that uh, there's a multitude of different um, ethnic groups and cultures that get lumped together in, in sort of one category, like, you know, Asian ethnicity or uh, black ethnicity, when when there's such important, important differences. And um, so, so the challenge is also capturing ethnicity better and um, capturing diversity much better than we do now. Next slide, please. So what's happening around the uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, uh, there are currently 170 vaccine candidates in the UK only. 15 are currently in trial, so I remember what I said about um, only 7% um, actually making it through the preclinical and then 20% um, to the clinical. Um, in South Africa, the UK um, and Brazil, there are human trials underway at the moment. Um, and and even though this feels quite rushed through, um, I want to reassure you that that it isn't because um, it, it there are no corners cut. So in the Ameri in the South African um, uh, trial development, for example, you have a, a small trial in 50 HIV negative patients to start off with, then in HIV positive patients with a compromised immune system. And then it gets rolled out to 2000 volunteers where you have a group that gets a placebo, one group that gets the normal uh, vaccine and one gets the double uh, dose. And, and then this is looked at and interpreted before it's rolled out. But it is actually uh, possible to to roll this vaccine out faster because we have um, a higher prevalence during the pandemic. So so we will have our answers quicker. And the good news about the COVID nineteen uh, virus is that it seems to be genetically stable, so it's it's likely to work in everybody well. So. Um, the promising findings from Oxford coming out now, but it is probably realistic looking at a available vaccine towards the beginning of next year, um, most likely. Next slide, please. 
So should you have it now? Or should you have it at all? Should you have it later? I can't answer this, but there are a few considerations that uh, I think are worth considering. So the, the main one is personal susceptibility. So your immune defense is weakened with age and with um, additional comorbidities. Um, so, so if you are in that uh, category, it's probably more likely to to be beneficial than not. Um, herd immunity is a big factor. So, um, for those who don't know what this means, um, when when about seventy percent of the population are immune to a virus, then it protects those who are not able to have the vaccine. So, people who are on chemotherapy. Uh, uh, organ transplant recipients, etc., can't have the vaccines, and um, and so so by by us protecting ourselves, we're also protecting others. There's the importance of participation. We've heard a lot this morning about um, so so Peter said said don't be a spectator a spectator, and and I think it's difficult in this um, sort of um, climate of distrust and and fake information and conspiracy theories uh, we heard earlier um, to 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 be able to make the right decision for yourself. And, and for that, I think we need to increase um, communication and honest dialogue um, and also be honest about what we don't know and what the risks are in a, in a kind of measured way. Um, altruism plays a part. So, so, you know, whether you feel that you want to um, give to the community, even though there are risks involved in getting getting involved early, and your personal perception of risk, of course, is is really important. And I think that's the end of my talk. So I'm, I'm very happy to to answer any questions if I can. Thank you um, so much, Connie. Um, we really appreciate particularly you coming along today because Connie is actually on leave today, um, everyone. <laughs> so we're just really, really um, appreciative. Um, and I can see within the chat that there are some questions, but um, I think because of time, uh, Connie, if, if you're able to, and obviously when you're back off of leave, we would really like to collate some of the answers to this. But it also rings true that we absolutely need to um, bring this as a workshop with our communities to address some of the concerns. And I think for the communities to have this information so that an informed decision can be made. So thank you so much, um, so much, uh, Connie. So now, um, uh, colleagues and friends, we just wanted to hand over um, to Stuart. Stuart has to um, kind of be off to, to attend another meeting. So we're just going to bring Stuart in to, to do his closing message. But if I can ask you all to just remain on screen once Stuart's finished, because we just really want to uh, make sure that we capture the evaluation and just some other in terms of next steps. So thank you very much. And thank you, Stuart. Um, that's brilliant. Thank you very much, Serena. I, I, I just wanted to say a very big thank you, Serena, to you, to Grace, um, and to the entire team who's been behind pulling the event together today. And it's, again, it's pretty phenomenal. We had 300 people um, sign up uh, for today. And just taking us back to where um, Lord Woolley started and talking about the fact that our understanding of inequality has gone from, you know, when the first time we met back in May, minus 10, to now a zero, it says that, that you know some significant things have happened in that period of time. But the real challenge for us now is we've again today heard a lot of you know the use of data that I've seen both in the last event and in today's event has been outstanding because it is thought provoking. Um, it gives us some things that we can really use to take action. And I think that is the challenge for us now is how we use everything <laughs> we've heard, everything we've seen, take that back into our organisations and um, turn it into action. And certainly for me, when we, we next uh, get together, Serena, and, and whether, whether that's in, in uh, a month or two months' time, I think that's what we need to see and that's the ambition we need to set ourselves, is what, what action has been taken as a result of this. Because, you know, we, we are talking about this, we are looking at how we weave this into our response to the pandemic in terms of, of how we help London to recover. And I think we now need to see what that looks like in, in the form of, of actions. And that really, for me, would be how we take it on again um, from this event. But just uh, to say a, a massive thank you, Serena, to you, um, to the team behind this, but also to everybody who's uh, joined us today for yet another really important forum, which is keeping this quite rightly, at the forefront of our thinking in terms of how we respond and how we emerge from um, this crisis. So thank you all very much.
Thank you. Um, and thank you, Stuart. And, uh, you know, thank you for the work. I know that you will continue to, to do across London as well to support this with your peers um, across the piece. So thank you very much. So, um, colleagues and friends, it's been absolutely brilliant to hear from, um, you know, just from everyone today. And, and again, you know, I always kind of leave this or from the last session, but leave this feeling really kind of G'd up and, and ready, ready for action. Um, I'm just going to um, whilst uh, or, or if we uh, hand over to um, Sheila, who is just going to uh, just yeah, speak to us about how we can uh, give our feedback from today's session. Um, hi, all. I've pasted into the um, into the chat how you can um, put your one word feedback as to what you thought of today's session in the in the chat. Um, you could also scan this QR reader on your screen. Um, I'm just going to put it back in again. So if you just click the link and you just put in your one word, um, I'm going to give it a few seconds and then I'm going to switch screens so you can see you can all see what the feedback has been so far. Okay, brilliant. So coming so while, in now. Brilliant. While you're doing that, Sheila, let me just um, yeah, uh, please kind of summarize round, next steps. Yeah, round up and let's look at next steps. So, um, I think from the panel this morning, we really heard about the need to show compassionate leadership for 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 both ourselves, our colleagues, but also for the communities that we serve. And you know, Lord Woolley, uh, uh, you know, prompted us to to be more ambitious than we've ever been before. Um, we already have the common purpose. We have, um, you know, kind of the same communities that we're supporting. So now let us um, take it, let's deliver. You know, as Stuart said, the next time that we come back, let's hear from the, the local areas about what actions or resolutions have been um, uh, delivered against. I think co-production with communities is how we will really ensure that actions make sense um, and that we're not doing stuff in silos and then delivering to Councillor Hamilton uh, made that point. Uh, we need to recognise, promote those who have demonstrated leadership. You know, let's build on what we have already seen. What Let's build on what we've seen demonstrated across um, this time. And I think inspirational presentations from both Birmingham and Hackney about the focus and creativity around community engagement. And it, it was clearly not a tick you know, not a box ticking exercise. There was a true determination to really connect with communities to learn and to make a difference. And I think finally, the conversation, um, Connie, around vaccines, and it's so useful for us to understand as practitioners, um, the, the kind of development and the usage of um, vaccinations. And I learned so much from that. But I think going a step further, we now need to bring this information to our communities so that they can make um, informed decisions. So we, um, and I can see the the uh, feedback coming in from, from um, the evaluation, thank you so much. But also we will be sharing the join-in instructions for you to be able to access the Knowledge Hub um, and this is going to be an information sharing platform where we'll be able to, um, you know, share information. All of the presentations, um, the kind of question and answers will be shared on that hub. So really important that you um, kind of just register that um, the link will be provided, I believe, in the chat. Um, and we can also follow that up um, by email. In terms of the working groups, I know as Sheila said, we were, we were literally uh, overwhelmed by the number of additional suggestions for working groups, and that's brilliant. So what we want to do is just take the opportunity just to filter through those, um, and then we will provide those back to you. Um, for the colleagues who have signed up to working groups, and if you haven't, please um, you know, put it in the chat, get your colleagues involved, uh, from your organisation. We will be, again, disseminating that information so you will understand who else is in your groups and then you can make commitments around meeting together in either a task and finish setting or, or working groups so that we can start to deliver on some of these key work streams um, that's really, really required. So um, from me, thank you, thank you, thank you um, for turning up today. Um, but let's make it count. Let's make it count for our communities um, and, and let's make sure that the, the recovery across London and beyond is much better than it would have been had we not taken the time out to meet today. 
Um, Sheila, I don't know if you want to just finish off in terms of the um, of, of what you're doing here in, in terms of the uh, interactive. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks all. Um, you can see on the screen we've had so much brilliant feedback from today. It was inspiring, motivational, um, inspirational, um, awesome, thought provoking. We've got lots of amazing um, one words coming there. Just um, thanks all for your feedback. If you've got any additional feedback, um, we what we'll do is I'll um, we'll put a site which has got the email address on it as to where you can send any additional feedback. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And um, thank you again to Jenny, Jenny Leonard, who will be um, sharing. Uh, oh, there we are. So we can see a, a, a snapshot of, of what Jenny has um, created. And this is just a summary of the key points um, uh, that we you know, have um, gone through uh, today. So thank you so much, Jenny, for your hard work in doing that. Hopefully you're able to keep up with all of the different um, uh, comments. So and we will be sharing all of this information, the summary, uh, and the video um, uh, that, that will also be available on YouTube, we'll be sharing that within the next couple of days. So thank you. And, and if the only thing that you leave with today is, you know, just please think and, and perhaps share in the chat if, if you feel able to. Just think about one action, um, one way in which you're going to do something different uh, as a result of this um, event. That would be really, really um, useful and, and will help us to move this agenda forward. So thank you all for your time. Um, I know it's been a long session. Have a really, really good afternoon. And remember to take care of yourselves. Thank you. Take care. Of you.